any other city. Right. But the numbers are increasing, and then it but, is. Uh, the good news from my city, we have 25 cases. All ah. 22 become negative. Only two are remaining now. Okay. Excellent. Good. Very good. Very encouraging. Yeah. Hope so. Hope all the. But Bombay and Pune are very bad. Very bad situation. Every yes. day 25. 100 cases added yesterday. Oh, yo. That's very, very bad. Mumbai is... <coughs> Mainly because of a lot of people traveling around that place. That's the main thing. I know. You know? I know. Even UK also, they have got 700 deaths yesterday. Yes. That's terrible. Maximum single day death and uh, yeah. mainly in London. Well, US, US also 900 plus something. So, we are live now. Currently, we'll okay. start in two minutes. <laughs> Lovely. Uh, do you want me to share the screen now? Yes, sir. I see Neeraj there is, is a Neeraj photo is there he's alive there Yes I am also here I am recording the program Oh I I, I just saw your photograph <laughs> Yeah yeah he is there Hello Arpal sir Hi Neeraj Hi Good morning everyone Arpal how are you I am good <clears> Hi, <throat> hey, Harpal. Swamitra. Hi, hi, Swamitra. How are you? Fine. <laughs> hi, George. Boss is always right. Not able to see her, Paul. So put on uh, your gallery view. Yeah, yeah. Itna bada sardar ne dikh raha hai Hi, Sunil. Hi, how are you? Good morning. How are I'm good. Okay, guys, we are live. So, <clears throat> Ashok, time to go. Yes, sir. And then uh, you, you may uh, keep people joining. Uh, we are missing out. Uh, still on John and Peter. Yes, sir. But we'll go ahead. If their cases come, then we'll just jump. Sure. Yes. Right. So, good morning, good noon, and good afternoon uh, from India. We are trying to bring the world together. Uh, it's an attempt uh, towards uh, rekindling our brotherhood and uh, make sure oh, that. We are all together. Uh, we have no, 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 no. all over the world. Uh, Professor Peter Jenneris, a professor of Leeds, and my dear friend, he will soon join us in a minute. Uh, my good friend and my co faculty during Davos course, uh, Miss Jane Ward uh, from Coventry. Welcome, Jane. Uh, my good friend again, JP from Philippines. Thanks, JP. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Uh, another good friend from Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, is Kerul. Kerul, welcome. Thanks for joining. I should. Uh, Thank you. We have uh, my dear friend, George Thomas, whose idea was to have this web-based <coughs> discussion on the platform. So uh, this is your uh, dream come true, George. Hi. Uh, welcome. Uh, we have uh, Jay Shankar from Chennai another senior uh, colleague and a mentor. Uh, welcome, Jay, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Shushu. Uh, Harpal Seli from Ludhiana, another good friend of mine. Welcome, Harpal. Uh, Shomitra Mishra 
from Kolkata. Uh, Swamitra, welcome and thanks for. Hi, sister. Hi, everybody. Uh, another very uh, good friend and a colleague, and I think we uh, leave our morning, afternoon, evening together is Dr. Sunil Kulkarni from Miras. So, welcome, Sunil. Uh, John will soon join us. Uh, before we kick start, a uh, couple of quick tips. Uh, I'm going to have the screen control so that there is no hodgepodge. I will run the cases which have been aligned according to femur, lower end femur, uh, um, floating knee, patella, and then proximal tibia in a sequence. I have tried to uh, put them together uh, so that uh, delegates who are listening to us from all over the world will get maximum benefit of your intelligence, your way of dealing with these uh, critical fractures, critical situations. Uh, I request all the panelists to keep their uh, speaker on, on mute mode. Raise your hand if you want to barge in. So, uh, uh, and then I will ask you to speak and put forth your valuable opinion. Please do not impulsively, reflexly barge in and start talking. No cross talking amongst the panelists, please. Please do not see on two monitors, your phone as well as uh, the computer because it will create a lot of uh, disturbance amongst the sound waves and the transmission. Uh, with this preamp, uh, may I request uh, my friend, Dr. George Thomas from Chennai to give a brief in few seconds or minute, and then we can kick start with the program. George, please. Unmute. George, unmute, please. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sushrut. I just want to mention that uh, we have to remember that this is not an official AO program because we were unable to get the uh, organizational issues sorted out in time. Uh, but every member here, all panelists and all part, uh, and all those who are presenting the cases, they are all members of AO Trauma. So basically this is a AO kind of course without an official mm -hmm. sanction. Just keep that in mind. We're not claiming that this is an AO course. Mm -hmm. that's, that's all I have to say. Welcome everybody. And Sushrut, you can proceed. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks, George. Uh, let's go mm -hmm. ahead with the uh, first case from JP. JP, I'm going to present and I will uh, ask you to defend your case when the time comes. So this is what uh, JP faced, uh, lower end of femur. Uh, this is a 61 year old female motor vehicle accident. JP, how open was this fracture? Open means what kind of open? Open type 3A. 3A. Uh, so Carol, what will you do in KL? This patient comes to you, lower end of femur, 3A. What's your classification? What's your concern? and describe this. Please unmute. Yes, okay, unmuted. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, this is a very common muted fracture. And um, in, in these sort of situations, we, we worry about probably vascular injuries first, uh, the swelling of the knee and how contaminated it would be in, 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 in our part of the world. Um, uh, blood loss is, is another thing. Uh, so can I, can I stop you there? Yep. So let's say if it's filled with uh, all oil and grease and everything, what will you do? Uh, once the patient comes in emergency room, what will you do? Uh, uh, I think for us, the, the first thing is to get the patient on uh, started uh, immediately on antibiotics. <laughs> Something broad spectrum before we can, can actually get some, some uh, tissue samples. Okay. Would you not uh, care for debridement, Kherul? Yeah, before before even the debridement in the <coughs> emergency department, antibiotics would be the first thing. Uh, yeah. Then, then the the second plan would be to to try and get them as quickly as possible into the into the operating theater to get a debridement and potentially an external fixator on. So, can you uh, describe me the way you debride in Malaysia? This three A kind of an injury. How will you go about it? What solution? Uh, what kind of lavage? And how will you do it? I think uh, the, the the most important thing in 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 debriding these sort of fractures is actually to to extend the 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 wound itself so that you can actually see the the uh, the, the the fracture areas. You need to debride all the 
um, you know, devitalized bone, all the devitalized tissue until you can see practically uh, normal tissue. Okay. Um, yep. well, would you believe more on your knife? Would you believe more on your fingers? How, how would you go about debridement? Well, visualization is probably very important. So that's why the the uh, the incisions would would be would be long, so that we can actually do, uh, see the whole the whole fracture fragments itself. Okay, JP, you want to say something? JP, unmute, please. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I, I agree with Cairo. This this case was courtesy of the hospital where uh, Bill and Richie came from, from the Philippine Orthopedic Center. Uh -huh. And we do get a lot of high energy trauma uh, like this. Again, as people mentioned, probably before the lockdown, more than after the lockdown. Um, I agree with all the principles pointed out, which is you have to extend the incision, do a good debridement, um, start antibiotics, start triple antibiotics. Um, there's a question as to what kind of fluids to use. Um, plain saline solution has been the one proven, but sometimes if there is some oil or grease, a little bit of a betadine soap solution just to wash out the oil, oily part of the wound may help, but you have to rinse it out right after with NSS as well. And then probably for this case, again, do a spanning fixator would be a good idea. Okay, good. So we, we all agree that debridement is the crux of the entire story. Uh, and then, of course, antibiotics and aggressiveness of debridement. Uh, Jane, what happens in UK? Compound grade 3A. Uh, would you, as a senior consultant, jump in or would you allow uh, a junior SHO to do the debridement? What's the take? Jane? Yeah, so we have uh, very strict guidelines and certainly I think 3As are probably much, much harder to debride. We as orthopedic surgeons alone tend to under-debride them. So this in the UK gold standard will be debrided by a consultant orthopedic surgeon and a consultant plastic surgeon with a specialist interest in orthoplastics. So would you uh, go midnight to do this debridement or what, what will happen? Uh, def definitely not unless it was grossly contaminated. So for us like agriculture or marine, or if there was a vascular injury, we'll worry about compartment syndrome. Otherwise it would go in daylight hours because the debridement, as you said, is categorically the, the hardest and the most important thing. Sure. Jay, sir, would you represent India and tell us what happens in our country? Yeah, I pretty much do the same way what Jane, Jane has said. Uh, we have a plastic surgeon, taking plastic surgeon together in all these patients and definitely not in the middle of the night. If there is, if there is no vascular injury, do it in the first thing in the morning. Mm -hmm. And uh, one more thing I want to add, apart from the you know uh, previous speakers mentioned about thorough debris, we want to take a culture, I think it should be done at the end of all your debris, not at the, in the emergency or anything. So after finishing all your debris procedure, you'll have to do it. So we take the plastic surgeon from day one, from the first debris itself. Jeffrey. Because we always felt sure. their debris is much, uh, you know, uh, yeah, thorough, thorough than what we do. Absolutely. Because that will uh, decide the ultimate outcome of the yeah. patient in terms of infection, not infection, right. or whatever. JP, shall I go yeah. ahead? Yes, please. So imaging. Uh, so that's the X-ray. Again. Uh, okay. Kerul, you want to take this up? Unmute, please, Carol. Okay, during the first debris point, I think um, I would probably apply an external fixator um, after the debris point. And then during that time, that, that would be a good time to get a, a CT scan to allow us to, to have a better picture of what, what things look like. Yep. So does this satisfy you, Carol? I think it's 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 good enough at the moment to, to actually get a, a, a CT scan based on that. Okay, uh, so CT scan is not available, JP. Uh, mm -hmm. But was there any intraarticular extension here at all? There is a suspicion there, isn't it? Yes. Mm -hmm. If you go back uh, two slides, you can go back to both pictures in the previous slides. You can actually see a split in the articular surface, 
-hmm. And this was, uh, and you go, when you do with the traction view, you can kind of see how it goes. So this one kind of looks like a, a C2 where you have a split in the articular surface, but a more comminuted um, met perimetaphysial area of injury for this. I agree with Kairul. Um, uh, you, a CT scan would be very helpful for all intraarticular injuries at this point. Um, again, going by Jane, it's, it, it would be great to have uh, consultant staff be able to do this in the uh, as an elective OR. I think if you do give their antibiotics uh, early on, then the surgery can wait until the morning and you have more senior staff doing it rather than having junior staff do it in the middle of the night uh, and not doing a thorough job. Sure. George, you want to say something? Unmute, please. Unmute. I just want to ask Dr. JP, uh, there are no other injuries because we are not seeing the hip and we're not seeing the ankle. And we're not seeing anything. Else. Yes. For, for this particular case, uh, no other injuries, just, just localized to this area. Okay. Sunil, what do, would you want to do next? Sunil, unmute and speak. Uh, if everything is fine and there is no any signs of an infection in 48 hours or 72 hours, we have to need to stabilize it. Of course, if the CT is not available, then planning will be difficult. If you see the rotation, the flexion of the distal fragment, which is going into a, a flexion. So we have to need to correct properly the flexion, which is going, both the condyles are flexed. This is the most detrimental factor. You need to align it properly. And there is a big fragment which must have pierced through the quadriceps, the anterior part throughout. If you see, it is cross patella. So you need to realign that. If Even if it is detached completely of soft tissue, I will not remove it. I will keep it there because that, that void will create lots of problems. Of course, we have to make sure that there is no any contamination for that particular fragment, which looks very big from the right from diaphysis to so some sort of artic cartilage remains on that fragment. So, so we, what will be your choice of implant, Sunil? I will use a long locking head uh, and that fix that fragment and go, go long locking head uh, uh, screws with the uh, uh, with the proper spanning of the screws. Now, there is a lot of debate and I also go for some sort of a medial buttress plate as well on the medial side. This really requires a dual plating, not a single plate. We will come I to that. Now change it now. Uh, Jay, sir, what will be your choice of implant? Just one liner answer, please. Choice of implant? Yes. Yeah. Lateral side, the long, you know, distal femoral locking plate uh -huh. with the screws as, you know, uh, three or four screws on the proximal fragment and then more number of five or six screws in the distal fragment, intraarticular fragment. And then probably I'll add on plate on the medial side as well because a lot of combination there. Yes. Okay. Herul, your choice of implant, please. One liner. Unmute, please. Uh, I'll use a, a long distal, uh, distal femoral plate. Uh, just one plate on one side, lateral side. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jane, what's your choice of implant? Uh, dual plating. Dual plating. So what decides, Jane, uh, dual plating in your case? So... Uh, I think, as I already said, the flexion of the condyles is the hardest thing to get back. There's a huge amount of metaphyseal comminution. It's going to take a long time to heal. And certainly in our experience, uh, a single plate's got quite a high failure rate. It's going to take a long time and you're bridging quite a lot of comminution. So that's why I would supplement this with a medial fixation as well. Okay. Uh, Harpal, what's your choice of implant? Unmute. Uh, Shushutsa, can I say just one point? Yeah, so sorry, I was mute. Yeah. So my, my plan is usually I go in the first stage because these are grade three open fractures. I would only go with a single plate on the lateral side and it's a long plate with a good span. And I like to put far, far screws. And I see the progress at six weeks at the max at 12 weeks, if it's not showing union or I feel, then I do a medial buttress to augment it and do a bone graft along with. I'm aggressive with the bone grafts in such patients. 
the goalie will end up with complications because the uh, biology is and stability is not that good. Okay. Uh, Swamitra, your choice of implant? I think uh, I would completely agree with what Harpal said. Initial to start with a lateral plate. Uh, then after six weeks, uh, again, I, I may uh, need to add a medial plate with bone guard. Okay. Uh, this was what was done, JP, right? Yes, so as most of the speakers mentioned, this was a distal femoral lat locking plate from the lateral side. Uh, there are a couple of interfragmentary screws connecting the articular fragments together. Um, and uh, as you said, a couple of points to mention are to restore the articular surface, reduce the flexion of the distal fragment, and try to get as long a plate as you can on the lateral side for these screws. No? So whether or not this plate is long enough, some people would actually prefer to have the plate all the way up to the uh, lesser, yeah, lesser truck area. Um, and the question on the medial plating is a good one. Um, option to do immediate medial plating or to do delayed plating, but early bone grafting or to do both at the same time. Uh, these, are, these are options, I guess, once you control the infection and uh, cover the soft tissues. Yes, Joel, you want to say something? Unmute. So, sure, somebody just sent me a message asking whether the audience cannot ask questions. No, I do. Audience can ask questions uh, at the end of the session, not uh, live, not live. How so, do they do that? In, uh, in the chat box. In the chat, they can go in the chat box and uh, mail uh, questions to Ashok Sham. Okay. Okay. So it's there in the uh, notification that we have sent. Right, I think they missed us. Okay, okay, so should can. Yeah. Should can I? Yes, Sunil. Uh, the first screw in the proximal fragment is very near to the fracture site. So uh, this is we are putting a bridge concept. So bridge concept is a little bit violated here. So this should have been started with the first screw, and the plate should have been a little bit longer, so that you get a really elastic movement, elastic fixation, because this may this may fail because of that screw probably i agree both with uh, with both points number one is that putting a screw too near the fracture site and secondly with the length of the plate uh, one of the issues we face in the philippines is um, if you use the longer plates you tend to have the end of the plate near the top lift off right i'm not sure if you see the same problem in, in your patients as well and if it lifts off, it tends to, uh, although it, it's not a factor for healing immediately or stability, it can affect range of motion of the, or, or irritate the, the motion of the knee later on. Sorry, let's uh, go on with this. Uh, what uh, really bothers uh, us in India with this kind of fracture JP, I'll tell you, is this void which is there on the medial side. Uh, because even though the plates are strong enough, we have seen uh, in almost 25 to 30% plate breakage. And we'll go ahead and we'll see uh, what uh, we in this part of the world is thinking about. But just to summarize what JP has suggested, distal femur fractures have a unique anatomy, needs adequate appreciation, goals should be absolute stability. Uh, and we have to keep mind the principles of open uh, fractures in uh, uh, such a scenario. Shomitra, you're around. Uh, let's have your case. You want to take this, Shomitra? Unmute, please. Mm -hmm. So it's a 32-year-old male patient, motor vehicle accident, two-wheeler, hit by car from behind. Uh, lucky that this is the only injury to his right lower limb. Uh, he was stable on arrival to our uh, ER. Um, Cervical spine, chest, pelvis, abdomen, no injury, no head injury. Uh, that's the x-rays. He has got a one and a half inch wound, just medial to patella. Distal neurovascular status normal. And that's his emergency room x-rays. You can see that uh, it's a proximal tibia, simple articular, and uh, comminuted metaphyseal, multifragmentary metaphyseal. It's a partial articular distal femur, and uh, uh, likely patellar dislocation. Uh, so, Jane, how will you uh, take care of this 
in the initial part what's your way of managing this um so very similar as the last case so principles of open management to start with which would be antibiotics and tetanus uh, in the emergency department this uh, would get a ct as well well as part of their major trauma ct we do something differently we don't culture um anyone with an open fracture whether we do it in theater pre or post abitement and i would definitely uh, this needs a lot of thought so apply a spanning external fixator to start with so will you do spanning external fixator before or after ct i i think you get more information after the uh, doing the ct after the x fix but the way that our major trauma is set up all these patients get ct'd initially on day 1 uh, jp what happens uh, ct before or ct after x fix spanning external fixator yeah in this particular case it looks very unstable it would be hard to move this patient around without a spanning fixator so i would go for a spanning fixator with the initial debridement and then do the ct scan okay herun uh same with me here all right uh, let's move on shomitra so we have taken to theater unde debridement done um patella dislocation reduced uh vmo and um, mpfl completely detached from patella and we did an e spanning x fix the clinical picture is actually a couple of days uh, post debridement okay so that's the ct uh, ct scan yeah, yeah. Uh, jay sir do you want to take this at this stage and suggest what should be considered right once the uh... wounds are clean and we are thorough with the deprimer and all that we need to go in for a definitive fixation mm -hmm. whatever the time the matters i think uh, you know basically you have to start with the fixing the intraarticular fractures the joint block both uh, distal femur and the proximal tibia and then the uh, distal femur looks little easier than the proximal tibia then then you come to the proximal tibia fix the intraarticular fragment in compression and then do a bridge plating for the on the lateral side for the tibia right and also we can actually even for the femur i would add a you know plate after fixing the intraarticular fragment to buttress it okay any panelist who would differ from what uh, jay sir has suggested please raise the hand so i will ask that person george do you agree can i ask first i i agree with the plan of dr jayshan okay jen you wanted to say something only that i'm really worried about the soft tissues of the proximal tibia uh, and it may not allow bridge plating so the only other thing completely agree with fixing the uh, the joint anatomically but whether you want to get your bridging with a fine wire circular fixator for the tibia because of the soft tissues yeah so nil you want to say something yeah uh, at the how many days after the fixator the somitra you have fixed that fragment i mean uh, you plan the definitive line of treatment uh, i am coming to that sunil okay so the next next that, idea. i would use a dual plate for the femur uh, for the tibia because of the big medial condyle will not be sufficient to hold by that lateral plate there is a big chunk of medial condyle so i would put a small buttress plate on the medial side as well on the proximal tibia because the, from the lateral side the the varus collapse cannot be prevented so we need to fix that on the medial side we need to fix it if you can show me yes see the the big medial fragment so the lateral buttress plate will not be able to solve it so i will put a, a buttress plate on the medial side two screws up to the shaft and then long plate on the lateral side so two plates double plating obviously yeah. okay Shomitra, you want to say something on this? Yeah, I means uh, now we are, uh, uh, can classify these injuries. Uh, there are uh, few classifications described. Uh, the most common use is the Fraser classification. Uh, if we take our case, which is a 2C, means a uh, distal femur articular and the proximal tibia articular. Now there was a little bit modification on the Fraser classification by Ran et al. Uh, they have included the patellar injury as a uh, Third modifier. So, if it's a patellar injury, that's a worse prognosis, and it's a 
it becomes a 3A as per modified Fraser classification. We'll go to the next slide. So uh, after the X fix, relook after 48 hours, wound is clean, but you could see if you see the lecture picture back, there's some blisters coming up in the upper leg and some in the lower thigh. Yeah, you can see the blisters uh, on the upper leg, the big uh, hemorrhagic blister on the medial side of the leg. They can proceed. Uh, so uh, question to you, uh, Jane, uh, if these blisters come, what do you do with these blisters, fracture blisters? Do you break them? Do you dress them? Do you leave them alone? Uh, no, we don't break them. We leave them alone. I think with it being blistered, I say, especially the proximal tibia, we definitely would avoid any internal fixation when the soft tissues look like that. So your strategy is either to go early and use something external or to bridge it and leave it. And sometimes you've waited two to three weeks until the soft tissues are settled. So it's safe enough to then to put your internal fixation in. Okay. Okay, Shomitra. Uh, so at that point of time, uh, I fixed the lateral condylar femur. I repaired the MPFL and the VMO with suture anchors, and I closed the open wound. But I uh, left the X fix because I am not going to fix the proximal tibia now because of the blisters coming up. Harpal, you next. You want to say something, Harpal? So my question is, uh, does it make the sense if blisters have only serous fluid or if they are red in color? If we can see the blood in the blisters, does the uh, management differ or does it remain the same? Jen, you want to answer that? Uh, no, so for me, it's the same. It's not necessarily about the blisters. It just shows how much damage to the soft tissues are. And then you make any cuts to put a fixation in, they're going to break down and you're going to need plastics. Sunil, you want to... Thanks. I wanted this point to be clarified because a lot of people think it other way around. So it's great that you clarified it. Good. Okay. So, Shomitra, moving on. Yes. yes. Uh, that's what you did. Yeah. Eight day post injury. Justify uh, number one, uh, why you closed that open wound? Were you very comfortable with whatever was there inside that wound? Did that... Uh, you know, kind of made you close the wound and do this internal fixation. What's your yeah, absolutely? Yes, that, that wound was just medial to patella, and I have done with the with my patella and femur work, and the wound was absolutely fine. No evidence of infection. No evidence of. Uh, so you know, I, I was quite uh, confident that that wound should do well. So I closed that wound. Uh, I kept the fixator because you know, as I as I told that there are blisters coming up. And uh, I planned uh, the fixation when the swelling comes down in the proximal, in the, in the upper leg. So that's what eighth day post injury. I went for definitive fixation as is what it was suggested. Uh, articular reduction, percutaneous fixed with convoluted screws, then a 4.55 lateral proximal tibia plate by a MIPO technique. Yeah. So, George, do you want to criticize or appreciate this fixation? Please tell us. No, I just want to ask, really, not criticize. Uh, right now, it looks very unstable on the medial side, as uh, Sunil already predicted it would be. Uh, but with the very bad soft tissue condition, see, the problem is that many of us are not, not very comfortable with the uh, thin wire fixators, at the elizer of type. So right now, uh, considering both the instability on the medial side, where probably you would require to put a medial buttress, otherwise it's unstable fixation. Uh, perhaps the Thin wire fixation is a much better option. Maybe Jane can say. Harpal? Harpal? That's exactly my question. How many of us would go for a ring fixator? Because I do a lot of ring fixators in trauma. So I think it's best to ask the panelists. My, my first thought is that I would manage this with a ring fixator. If there's blisters, open fracture, and so much combination. I would. It's easy to manipulate, easy to hold. And it's anyway going to unite in 10 to 12 weeks. So I'd like to know the other panelists' views on this. So starting from me, I am a no for a ring fixator. Jane, yes or no for ring fixator? Uh, I'm a fix the articular fragments with internal fixation and get them anatomical, but okay. then use a ring fixator to bridge your tibia, better for alignment, early weight bearing, better for the soft tissues. So hybrid. Sunil? No, no, fix, no illusion of fixation. Uh, George, unmute. In this, 
in this situation, uh, I think the plan which Jane said is the wisest plan. Hybrid. Okay. JP? I agree with a hybrid fixator. Uh, Jay, sir? I was never comfortable with a ring fixator. Uh, Carol? I, I'm, I'm not too fond of, of ring fixators. So, Harpal, that answers your thing. 30% uh, ring fixator, 70% uh, some kind of internal fixation. Out of that 30% also, 20% uh, is hybrid fixation. So that answers your question. And that's all over the country, Harpal. We are shying away from hybrid or ring fixator. We have had a spur of ring fixators all over the country 10 years back. Even neck femur uh, has been treated, trochanteric fracture, you won't believe it. I've seen. And when I asked the faculty, how would you remove it? So God will remove, Eliza Rao knows how to remove that. Anyway, uh, no pun intended, but uh, that's what has happened. Uh, double plate fixation for this is the way to go. Shomitra, why did you not put double plate? Was the skin a reason for not putting Shomitra? Absolutely, absolutely. Because I was uh, I was not really uh, comfortable putting a double plate um, uh, on looking at those blisters. So uh, there's a minimum intervention I could do at that point of time. May uh, could add a medial plate later, but you know. Uh, yeah, and I, I understand. Didn't... Yeah. So Sunil, if there is a huge wound on the medial side with almost exposed tibia, in that case, where would you uh, put your uh, double plate? Or in that singular case, would you put a uniplanar fixator? Is my question. Sunil. Uh, so different uh, case or this case? This case. This case, the blisters, blisters. I would not operate till the blisters get get down and completely wrinkle sign is positive. If the skin is good for the lateral side, it will be same for the medial side as well. It is not like the lateral side is okay and the medial side is not okay. So it has no, to be both sides. I should be planned prior prioritarily that I would put a medial buttress first, not on the lateral side first, but the medial buttress. See the posterior combination as well. And if the wound is, uh, the medial skin is not good, I will wait till the skin is good. If it is open and fracture side is, uh, is seen through the skin, then I will again wait. We'll put a fix on a fixator, put a wax, put a skin gap, and then go for a plating. Okay. Or maybe continue with Elizaro. So, Shamitra, take this further now. 10% of the cases. Okay, Shamitra. Yeah, the, the wound dealing was satisfactory. So I started knee range of motion. I need to consider a lot of factors because I had to repair the VMO and the MPFL as well. Uh, so knee range of motion started to tolerance. non head wearing mobilization for six weeks. Toe touch weight wearing after six weeks. And full head wearing progressively after 12 to six, 16 weeks. Unfortunately, I do not have the serial x-rays. Uh, that is the x-ray after 16 months. You know, uh, at that point of time, he had a knee range of movement 0 to 110, no quadriceps lag, and he was mobilizing full head bearing from about uh, 16 weeks' time. Mm, go ahead, Susruth. Uh No, I want to ask Sunil something. Okay, yeah. Sunil, Sunil, yeah. Sunil, Sunil, what's your defense now? See, don't give a wrong message that uh, one or two cases will unite. I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you that double plating should have been done in this case. Yeah. So, but, the, the uh, message is, when there is a combination, the by column, the column concept has come now. So, each column has to have at least one, especially on the medial side, whether it is a medial, posterior medial, or dead anterior medial. So, whatever it is, you have to select with the CT scan and then plan it properly for the plate. You may use a low profile plate. That I would now suggest that you low profile plate so it will not be good for the soft tissue. There will be a footprint will be a much less on the bone. So the, but it gives a real good buttress on the medial side and then go for lateral side. That's my take home message. Okay. So Shamitra, go ahead, please. Yeah, he had uh, three small um, discharging sinuses. So I planned implant removal at 18 months, a small few small sequestrum removed, deep tissue samples sent for culture and given sensitive antibiotics and antibiotic load stimulant that um, heal the uh, infection. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, now there are a lot of uh, studies on the outcome of these injuries, and uh, you could see that Karlstrom Ullerud has given us a very good grading system for the outcome. They, that actually that paper came long before the class. I think a year before the classification came of uh, uh, Fraser classification came. So there are subjective and, obje and objective uh, uh, symptoms and signs on which you decide on the on the grading system. Uh, go uh, one slide ahead. Uh, there are a lot of papers on the outcome. Uh, go back, please. A uh, lot of uh, paper on the outcome. One from our friend uh, Monappa as well, and Professor Sharad Rao from Manipal, and all of them uh, have shown that open injuries and uh, and articular the fractures, in the articular uh, uh, fractures, they have a very poor outcome. Okay. Um, so uh, what you can take home is a high velocity injury, and there can be multi-system injuries that can. Know, affect the uh, treatment plan as well as your outcome and articular injury patellar injury has got a very poor functional outcome okay all right jay sir you are yes. this is your yeah, i'm on yeah i'm on tell us sir okay uh, this is actually about 3 years ago yeah so 33 year old male right uh, following an rta open injury to the right knee and that's the picture uh, i also have the Clinical picture of the open wound. Do you can you show it, uh, Sushut? Yeah. Yeah, that's the open wound on the medial side. And there's one more, I think. Yeah, that's post debris. Yeah. So we have talked a lot on uh, debridement and open fractures already. So let's move forth uh, in showing them uh, the CT. So Jen, this is the CT. What do you want to do? I noticed the previous side. It said that the patient was unwilling for external fixation. Was right. that a uh, is a temporary or is a definitive? No, it's a temporary. Patient is not willing for a temporary external fixator because you are in India. We need to look at the cost of two operations, so we balance a lot of things and do. So I patients, think, yeah. I, I don't think there's necessarily any need for all open fractures to get external fixation. I think it's more about getting your definitive closure at the same time. Right. So if you can do it all in one sitting, but that's also what we would do in the UK as well. So you'd have to have a look after debridement, whether the wounds are going to close. They're fairly distal. So even if the distal one didn't, probably a medial gastroc would get to it anyway. Um, so probably very similar to the first case try and get the joint as good. Uh, when the joint is good as an articular block, attach that to the diaphysis. Again, the big metaphyseal comminution. So you're probably looking at uh, uh, both medial and lateral plates here. JP, JP, what will you do? Yeah, the, the one that's more concerning about this is if you look at the CT scan, there seems to be a lot of articular level comminution. So whereas the other one was a C2, this would be a C3 injury. And they're always a lot, very hard to put back together, especially when they have small articular fragments. So I agree with Jane, you do have to try to fix them as best as you can. Um, what we try to teach our uh, registrars is to try to get the width of the femoral condyle to match the width of the tibial condyle to make sure you're not fixing it too wide or too narrow and try to get it as best as you can and then bridge it, uh, span it later. Um, so it's, it's hard. Implant, I yeah. I, I, the, it, it would be hard to do this um, without the option of having an external fixator to span it at first, because that would be, I think, an important part of the process. You span it first, let the soft tissues quiet down, uh, and then come back and plan and do a definitive fixation. I think you can do a distal femoral locking plate here with some screws, uh, probably not to compress the condyles more than you have to. So how do you judge that intraoperatively, not to compress, not to overdo it? Right. If you have an intraoperative x-ray, you take an intraoperative x-ray and you make sure the femoral condyles match the width of the tibial condyles. So you don't like over tighten them too much and they don't squish down and you end up with a malunion of the articular surface. So you'll use only one plate on the lateral side. Is that what you say? Um, going back as what, what was mentioned a while ago, if you have significant medial comminution, it would be an option to do a medial plate. Uh, for, the, for the femur, you're not too worried about uh, soft tissues. The soft tissues uh, aren't aren't as are, are more forgiving. 
So you could do that, or you could do it later on when you do your bone graft as well. Okay. So, uh, Carol, what will you do? What's your choice of final implant? Yeah, I think I, I, I agree with JP. If, if we can, if we, um, I mean, bearing in mind in, in terms of cost, um, getting the, the femoral condyles right is, is, is probably the most important thing. And if we can reduce the cost by just applying, like say, a, a lateral distal femur plate, uh, and then delaying um, uh, slightly the range of motion, then that may be that may be an option. But if let's say we're getting delayed union because of the severe comminution in the metaphyseal area, then during that particular point in time, we can actually go in and put in the, the, the medial plate and bone graft. So you will not put uh, medial plate primarily is what you're suggesting, is it? Yeah, yeah, that's right, yes. Uh, George, any other idea? Unmute, please. I think the real way to save costs here is to use the medial plate also, because two operations will be more expensive. And almost certainly on the medial side, there's so much combination on the medial side that we need some support on the medial side too. Sunil has got some uh, innovative, cheaper ways of, uh, of uh, we'll come to the medial Harpal. side. Putting Harpal, in some what will you do? Harpal? Uh, I'm sorry, I missed the first X-ray, but if it's a grade three open fracture, my protocol remains the same. Debridement, X-fix. So Once let's the uh, looks... forget about the open part. This is the fracture. Uh, you have to treat this internal fixation. What's your choice of implant? Uh, with such kind of combination, I would go for two plates, definitely. If it's a closed fracture, first time, two plates. Sunil. Uh, I we... personally have to last you know the reason. Because uh, we have treated now, comparing with the which pass on the enders then on the medial side, that will give a elastic fixation. That was uh, the theme. So we are waiting for the comparative study, both uh, dual plating and lateral side plate, medial side plate, a lateral side plate, and a lateral side enders then. Let's see the result. But I can use enders then here. Very very good on this side. So what's your gut feeling? Lateral plate and enders medial would. Uh, Win the race or what, what will win the race? Uh, lateral plate and the endosnail. Because the medial, already there is a wound. So we don't know about the infection. What about the infection will be higher. So that we can pass at the time of, of passing a, a lateral side plate, we can pass the endosnail. And if at all you want to revise after six weeks a bone graft or something, and if it is not showing any result, you can just take off the endosnail and put a plate on the medial side. So as they say, there are many ways to skin the cat. You can put a ender snail, you can put a tens, you can uh, put a flexible reconstruction plate, intramedullary going all the way up, uh, medially, that has to be done percutaneously. But uh, we in India are preferring to do it primarily rather than wait for delayed union to show up or lateral plate to break up. Uh, Jai, sir. Yeah, go ahead with the next slide, uh, Shashut. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I've connected all the open wound on the medial side, extended into the joint. And you can see the medial open wounds are connected for the exposure of the joint. And the first that you can see the intraarticular fixation with multiple KOS. Try to get as much of articular block reconstruction as possible in this case with multiple individual uh, compression screws. And then uh, uh, try to achieve as much of as absolute stability and restoration of the articular block. And then I put a yeah, lateral plate by a MIPO technique, also added a medial plate, and that's what you see. That's an intraoperative picture. Go ahead and show the next uh, sequence of slides. Uh, that's the intraop uh, picture, and that is for uh, post-op. Um, next one. Yeah. That's at six weeks post-op. And next one, that's at six months post-op. No bone grafting was done primarily or secondly, that's one year. And that's about two years. I can go ahead and show the clinical picture to shoot the bureau column. That's the incisions and that's the function. Yeah, uh, coming back to uh, Jay, sir. Yes. When I asked, uh, when I was in Davos last time, right. what is the kind of stability that you achieve by putting the lateral plate and a medial supporting plate? So the answer was very funny 
and they call it as a relative absolute stability because you know it's yeah, correct, correct. relative stability it's neither absolute stability we want some movement there yeah so it's not as uh, rigid rigid as absolute stability and it's not also as flexible as a relative stability because right. otherwise the plate would break in kodi this kojima kodi kojima has given a separate name for that this particular i'm yeah. not getting that so it's kodi only to... told me this is yes. called as relative absolute stability yeah so it was kodi only who said this um anyone uh, panelists uh, any questions for jay sir yes shomitra I mean, sir, I had a very bad experience with a couple of cases with open fractures. Now, what was the status of the quadriceps mechanism? Because I had two cases where quadriceps mechanism was completely detached from the patella. I think it's, uh, Shamita, you're right. I think you are, it's very, very important to assess the quadriceps mechanism before you go in and do all these things. Luckily, in this patients, that was not disturbed. So I had a, you know, I did not go ahead and do anything as you rightly. you showed in your uh, you know example you need to address that also yes you must be aware of that and then you should check for the quadriceps uh, you know mechanism whether it is intact or it's uh, torn yeah i have one case where a delayed rupture of the quadriceps tendon after 3 months and came with complete you know uh, quadriceps lag okay. uh, and i had to do a repair and reconstruction uh, a late repair and reconstruction and i had one acute rupture of uh, quadriceps completely which i had to repair immediately on table but that patient had uh, had, had a very stiff knee till now right. so bottom line jay sir and sudhir question to you both this additional plate that we use uh, medially here as well as medially in tibia in the previous uh, shomitra's case this plate or nail should not be or is not required to be strong enough as the lateral primary plate right it's a buttress effect Butter, yeah. a buttress plate you can use a small i would have used a very small uh, plate uh, this is a locking plate i would have used a small plate as well but you can use a locking plate which gives you the uh, two screws up two screws down that's all yeah. but you need to stabilize on the medial side which will need to do a prevention of varus both in distal femur as well as in proximal tibia i think this, this, this medial plate is a locking one Yeah. You know, see the length of the lateral plate, and yeah. the number of screws in the articular block, and this medial plate is just supporting that, you know, the medial column. Otherwise, we see the medial side, you feel that it might collapse. So it's, I, you know, I just added, no bone grafting was done, primarily or secondarily. Also, the rotational stability, which is also important on the medial condyle. So right. medial condyle tends to rotate even by the pull of the quadriceps. So it is not good enough to from the lateral side. So that is also we have seen. so when there is a bicondylar fracture and one is rotated fortunately i don't know the ct is not properly seen whether it has got a hofas element usually the c2 or c3 type of fractures you get a hofas element true you must look for that yep so let's move on uh, that's an excellent uh, clinical <coughs> result also uh, john is still not here with us right as I yet he is here john is joined us john is here yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, just got in. Just managed to log in. Was trying hard. <laughs> right time, John. Okay. <laughs> What a timing! Hi, yeah. hi, Peter. Good morning. Hi, hi, everybody. This is John Mukhopadhyay here. John, okay. some of you, but not everybody. I have to go to gallery view, I guess. I don't know where that is. Okay. Can you see the slides? Ah, uh, yeah. So shoot, Peter. Hi, welcome. Hi. So should I get started? Yes, please. All yours. Okay, so this is uh, a 60-year-old lady who was involved in a road traffic accident and had a fracture of her distal femur, closed injury, and no other uh, injuries or comorbidities. Okay, and these uh, uh, can you do this? Uh, I will do it. Yeah. The initial X-rays. The uh, lady didn't present to me at this time. These were the initial um, X-rays. <coughs> So John, any comment on the X-rays? Audio yeah. is not proper. We lost you. Okay. Uh, is that any better? Yeah, I can hear. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, oh, I can yeah, hear. I can hear. I can hear. Okay. So okay. So is that better? Yeah, that's better. Okay. So this is the X-rays. 
so we have to go by the x-rays because there was there's no CT available at this stage. So don't ask for the CT. But I think uh, the x-ray tells us a lot of things. And uh, we need to look at uh, first the x-rays and then what options would you use to fix this? Okay, Shushut? Uh, yeah, so Kerul, do you want to take this? What, what do you want to do? Unmute, please. Yes, okay. Um, I think from from the from the from the lateral lateral view, you can actually see it's a it's a community supracordial fracture of the femur, and I would say that there is an intraarticular extension to to this. Um, it is uh, the 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 medial the medial condyle seems to be well well rotated uh, compared to, to to the other aspects. Okay, so but no significant intraarticular comminution. Yeah, that's right. Yes, metaphyseal comminution. Okay, good. Correct. Yes. So okay. we have this uh, option between a single lateral lock plate and additional medial fixation. And I just saw the last bit of the last case, so it comes in at a good time after that. Okay. Right. So yep. How would you, uh, the panelists, deal with it? Well, I think I think the, the the first aspect is is you know there, there's there, it looks like the the the, the shaft of the femur is actually jammed into the uh, articular surface. So actually, to trying to get it dis disimpacted and and realign is probably the most important thing. And okay. then the next thing is to get the the, the rotations of the of the the condyles. Uh, number one, uh, <coughs> medial correct to lateral, and then both as an articular box uh, to to the shaft. Okay, great. So, but would you uh, be happy with one long plate, or would you go for a medial, additional medial plate? Well, I think uh, at the first instance, it, it really depends on how stable I can get the the uh, articular block. Uh, if we can get enough screws uh, in the articular block to say that it's it's stable, uh, and once I put in the the lateral plate, then uh, I'll need to assess what the medial uh, side is like. Okay, accepted. Any other comments, Shushud? JP? Yeah, I would. Hi, John. I would hi, agree. Hi, JP. Good to see you. I would agree with Kairul. If you look at the x ray of this patient, it almost looks like a supracondylar fracture of a humerus in a, in a child, in that you have a very, very small uh, distal fragment to work with, right? So I agree with uh, prioritizing the articular block first, fixing together, and then trying to see how much stability you can get. Um, my concern here would be how much fixation you would get on a distal fragment with just a single lateral plate. Uh, most of your screws will probably be like interfragmentary screws crossing the, um, the, the fragments. Um, in this particular case, you would be using, if you opt to do a double plate, it would be to add fixation stability and not so much to bridge a uh, comminution or a bone loss in that area. Okay, good. Peter? Welcome, Peter. Hi. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. And good morning all the, to all my good friends from uh, Leeds. Hi, Peter. How are you? Good. We are uh, in the middle of the storm here. Yeah, but apart from that, we are still healthy and uh, we keep on uh, fighting. Thanks for joining, Peter. Thanks. I appreciate it. Uh, pleasure. Pleasure for the invitation. So uh, 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 all the previous speakers highlighted the issues when we have to uh, address the fixation of these uh, distal femoral fractures. The key issue here is whether you can get enough stability in the articular block, uh, which will um, allow early range of motion and minimize the risk of uh, uh, failure of metal work, uh, non-union, and obviously uh, a delay in terms of um, uh, functional uh, improvement in terms of uh, the patient's perspective due to the ongoing painful stimuli. So uh, I I consideration of a second uh, plate over the medial column is quite essential. Uh, biomechanical studies have um, highlighted recently that it provides a better uh, stability in terms of uh, the torsion that is exerted at the distal um, femoral site and around the knee. So I think a, a CT scan would have been very helpful to evaluate the amount of um, 
uh, bone stock available distally, the extent of the articular uh, involvement, and to assist you with your preoperative planning to evaluate whether one long lateral plate will be sufficient to address all these demands or whether an additional plate on the medial side would also uh, augment the fixation and uh, minimize the risk of um, the anticipated complications to occur. Other options that have been uh, um, utilized in uh, the management of these uh, fractures is to insert some form of an intra-articular and uh, intramedullary medullary strut. strut, which will provide some extra support to the medial column, uh, working as an augmentation device, but also as a stabilization uh, means for the medial column. So these are my thoughts, like the rest of um, our colleagues. Uh, okay. it, the mechanical uh, component in these fractures is very, very important. We also know in terms of the biological uh, aspects, the distal uh, segment of the femur has the poorest blood supply in relation to the diaphysis and the pro proximal one third. So uh, also thinking about the approach and how to minimize the devitalization of the fragments is very important in this case. Okay. Well, Jen, uh, I just think, Jen. I think, uh, should we go on? Or do you want to ask more questions at this stage? That's all right. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I think so this was what was done. Okay, so again, as I said, this patient hasn't yet come to me. And this was what was done uh, by a fairly competent surgeon. It was, I mean, it wasn't uh, uh, done in some sort of... Uh, yeah. So, so a stronger medial... Uh, a lateral plate and a reconstruction medial plate, right? Yeah. Okay. Shall I go ahead, John? Yeah, please. Oh, so one sec. So there's one thing I'd like to bring to the point here is, um, can we just go back to the last slide? Sure. Uh, so I think when we are putting the medial plate for these fractures, you really need to study the medial condyle very carefully. Because if you look at this, although we don't have CTs, but just looking at the x-rays, you can tell that it's quite a large medial fragment with a postromedial beak. And if you really want to buttress this with a plate, the ideal place to buttress it would be postromedially. This plate, where it is, is not really adding, uh, providing the kind of support you would expect. Uh, and it's a thin plate. So I, I would be a little... And of course, I would use a longer lateral plate as well. So, so uh, we can progress to the next slide, which is at six months and uh, eight months. And the surgeon who was dealing with it felt that it was uniting. As you can see that the lateral plate is quite anterior and was causing a problem to the patient uh, in terms of its prominence. So he decided to remove the lateral plate at this stage. Okay. 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 And so this was what it looked like. He also removed the wires from the patella, which interestingly was an approach he used. He used a trans patella approach to fix the fracture in the first place. Wow. Okay, so as did you can see, sorry. Did, did he remove uh, the plate without doing a CT? Yes. I think it was felt clinically that there was callus and uh, uh, because the plate was bothering the patient, he felt it was okay because he had a medial plate. But I think in retrospect, obviously it wasn't the right decision. Peter, do you suspect that it has not united here? Would you do a CT before re removing the, the plate? The plate yeah. has been uh, coming in the way of his uh, flexion because it's yeah. getting more prominent laterally. This well, X-ray to me, uh, you know, it's a retrospective thinking CT should have been done, but, but this look, seems yeah. to be it seems like on the AP, but on the lateral, when you see this gap on the posterior aspect, yeah. where you would normally anticipate first to see most colors there and healing and also some in some uh, kind of um, lucency in the middle, mm -hmm. it will be worrying to me because there is no colors at all. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I would be a bit concerned. And then if there is irritation, we see a lot of plates like that, and is not the plate irritation is pain because of a non-union. So I would be a bit careful. 
uh, how to analyze the patient complaints before I will execute my next uh, plan of action. Yeah, I, I, th I think I'll agree with Peter there because we've seen a lot of cases which when you look at the x-rays, it looks like things are healing. But when you see the get a CT done, you can see a clear demarcated fracture line, which is in a different plane. So you can't see visualize it adequately on the x-ray. And uh, I think it's worthwhile getting CTs done in them if there's any doubt uh, before you remove implants. So I would, I would go along with Peter on that. So is that a routine for you, John, now? Not a routine. If it's obviously united, I mean, if the x-rays show you callus all around and no, but if there's any doubt and we see a lot of patients who come late to us where the treating surgeon has said it's uniting, uniting, it's all right. And they continue to have some pain and you do a CT and you clearly can see demarcate the fracture line, which will actually show its non-union with sclerosis of the ends, et cetera. So I think there's a huge difference between what you see on the x-ray and what you see on the CT. In yeah, I mean, retrospective thinking that, okay, CT should yeah, be yeah. done to demarcate. This, this is retrospective, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So this okay. is what happened was, uh, at, uh, and three months after the plate removal, this is what happened, okay? Yeah. And this is when she presented to us. Okay, so now what would you do? Now I would get a CT. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we do. We did get a CT. We don't have it, but it was obvious that it hadn't united at that stage. Yeah. Okay, no, no. I agree. Not just for uh, for the non-union, but also to evaluate the articular block and see um, I, what are the options now. Can I do a retrograde nail? Is there enough bone stock, or do I need to consider again some form of, uh, you know? Plating again with bone grafting. So, uh, Peter, so on in uh, to query the answer of yours, would you be looking for uh, what kind of stability would you be looking for in this fixation of yours yeah, at this non union? Yes, Sunil. Before doing it, I would like to take an ORG. It's, you have to take a full leg x ray. You have to see the mechanical axis. Whether, yeah, yeah. Where the, there it is deformity whether it is acceptable deformity or not, because you have to plan the osteotomy to close it. So if you want to do osteotomy, nail is out. So we have to do a dual plating again with the absolute stability. It is a non-union. So we need to do absolute stability, which okay. has anterior angulation as well as probably a varus or a valgus. If your lateral condyle is in valgus. So maybe a more valgus. So you need to correct that. Okay, I agree. But uh, hope you also, ruled out the infection, John. Yeah. Infection yeah, as well. Of course, that's an important part of any non-union that has been healed, uh, that's been treated operatively below, uh, before and even non-operatively, is to rule out a non-union, uh, any infection. So clinically and in lab studies, there was no evidence of infection, but you still have to be prepared to make a decision on the table. Yeah, I agree. Hello, go ahead, John. Yes, please. So uh, the single plate or double plate, this was the issue that Somebody brought up two plates, uh, just like the panelists' view on that. So Peter, one plate, two plates. Before you came, we were talking of single plate or double plate, Peter. So tell us, uh, biomechanically, can a single plate offer absolute stability? Well, uh, uh, not <laughs> even, even a locking plate, particularly when you've got that kind of comminution on the medial sides, there is always some micro movement. And that's why we see a lot of callus formation also with the locking plates, particularly from the medial side spreading across because of the micro movement. So uh, the answer is no. And the question is whether one plate with a large working length will be sufficient to um, uh, address adequate mechanical stability, and then you need to look into the biological component. Uh, as I said previously, the uh, blood supply to the distal uh, uh, femoral um, uh, segment is not that great. And whenever I've got these sort of cases, in my practice, I always bone graft them. Okay. So, uh, so I think uh, we've done a lot of these non-unions and we do use double plates, but where it's possible to get lag screws across, I think they work beautifully. So here was a situation, and this is a situation when you have a large medial condyle 
And if you look at the locking plates, the screws are all designed to go anti, especially the uh, original locking plates, which did not have polyaxial screws. Okay, so the posterior part of the medial condyle just doesn't have any fixation. If you go back on the original x-rays, and I've seen this in a lot of non-unions that we see. If you see this huge posteromedial condyle, there's hardly any fixation which is supporting that. Okay, and I think a lot of non-unions are related to that. And so my aim here was we managed to get two really good lag screws. One was a 6.5 screw and the other was a 4.5 millimeter screws. And then we put a polyaxial locking plate, fairly long, long enough for the uh, well, sort of function that it was supposed to. And this is what we ask you wanted. Yeah. Are you, are you not uh, taking too much of a risk of by not putting an additional medial support? Did you well, not? You have, to, you have to judge that based on your lag screws. If you can get good hold on your lag screws, then you're getting absolute stability. Your plate is doing a supporting role. Uh, if you are at all worried about your lag screws, that is a different thing. So I was able to get good solid hold on these lag screws and I felt that was enough. John? Yeah. How many incisions? Same one incision. Yeah. You can see the suture line there. Okay. So we didn't even extend it. So the, the last bit of the plate was slid through. Yeah. Any more questions to John at this point in time? Was it bone grafted as well, John? Yeah. Yeah, I agree with Peter that most of these non-unions, if you're going there, you may as well bone graft it because you don't want to have to come back again to bone graft it. And it, it, it's not just that, is that um, uh, I've seen patients with uh, 10 attempts to heal a distal femoral fracture. You need to promote an accelerated healing response because your exactly. situation, if there is a delayed healing, delayed union, you end up having the risk of having a metal work failure again. Sure. So you need to boost the biology as well to get out of this vicious cycle of non-union and also delayed union. Absolutely, I agree entirely. So this is her three and a half months post-op. Good movement. She is walking without support by now. And this is her at five, 15 months post-op. Okay. Did you take any biopsies for infection, uh, John? Yeah, we took cultures and biopsies. That's a routine for any redo surgery. They, yeah, were, okay. yeah. they were negative. Yeah. And she's got good motion. She healed well and uh, she's doing fine. So that was the follow-up at the end of it. So I think it's important. Again, it comes back to the same two things, stability and biology. When you're, especially with your dealing with non-unions, you really need to make sure that you've got a very good stable fixation. And of course, you need to augment biology where it's required. And for us, uh, it's still just bone graft. We don't have access to uh, yeah, things like BMP, et cetera. Uh, and I'm not sure how often it's absolutely necessary, but uh, there are certain situations where if we did have it, we might think of using it. But by and large, I don't think in most of our cases, we've needed it. Okay. Yeah, looks good. Thanks, John. Yeah. Good case. Okay. Great. Okay, let's move on. Uh, Kerul, your turn. Are you around? <laughs> uh, yes, I am. Yes. Okay. This is yours. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, we we met with a 29 year old male who's, who works as a mechanic and fell from a height of seven feet onto the point of his left knee. Uh, he was trying to pick a tire from from the where it was stored, and he actually fell directly on it. Uh, obviously immediate swelling and he says that he couldn't put weight through his leg because he has no strength. So next slide, please. Yep. Okay, so uh, he presented to, to us after, after coming from a different hospital. So he's got a back slab on, a very comminuted fracture of the, of the patella. Uh, pretty difficult to see on the AP. We can see uh, something that's probably uh, a bit, a bit, looking less sinister on, on, on the lateral. Uh, so next slide, please. So, Jen, what would you do for this? Mm. Jen. Who's that? Jen. Um, and it, sorry, it was closed, isolated injury. It's, it's closed, yes. 
Uh, I feel like this is going to end up more complicated than it originally looks. Um, for me, I mean, it looks like a, a technically challenging uh, patella fracture. So we would just uh, attempt to fix it, but knowing that it's, it's going to be tricky and actually I've, certainly I'm going to really struggle to get the articular joint uh, as good as I'd want it to. So my goals would really be just to try and restore his extensor mechanism so that I can move him early. George, what's your choice of implant here, George? Can't hear you. In India, it all depends. I mean, we don't have a choice, do we? And um, uh, okay, there are funny plates, but I've never used them. So uh, as Jane said, I mean, I'm sure Carol has not presented this because it's simple, it's difficult. So I, I would be very careful. I mean, I would, uh, I, the only things we have are stainless steel wire and K-wire. Uh, that's all we have. Screws are difficult. You're, to you're itching to say something, Sunil. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's ask Sunil to say. Yes. Yeah. He said that there's a fancy plate, so I have, we have started using a plate, which is yeah. now with the small plates, very small plates, which we use for the metatarsals. We can have a spanning star-shaped plates. Now we are devising a plate for patella, so we can put up a, a small patella plate, which is a very thin. It should not irritate the skin. That's very important. Is so otherwise, it's like a medium malleolus, same thing with the skin on the patella as well. So we fix the tension pan and then put a plate so that it will not give way. I've seen it, but I've never used it. Yeah, so uh, there's uh, also, if you look at the x-ray carefully, the comminuted fragment is not just in the middle, it's actually the medial side of the patella. So that's something, that's right. I mean, these are the situations where maybe a CT would also help you, but... Uh, just based on the x-ray, you can see that the comminuted part is the medial part as part of the upper fragment. So getting it together may be difficult uh, using the conventional techniques that we have. So here's a situation where you really need to assess it very carefully. And if you have the choice of plates, it may be an additional uh, tool in your armamentarium. I have used it a couple of times for really comminuted cases. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I, that, okay. I think that that's these these are very good comments from 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 the panel that that we've seen. Um, I mean, the the reason this 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 case was brought onto this this sort of complex fractures around the knee is because uh, we've we've tend to miss a lot of the patella stuff, and yeah. uh, from from this we can see we've mentioned nicely that there's there's a, quite a large uh, intraarticular sort of delamination that that's occurred. The other problem is the anterior surface of the of the um, of of the patella as well is 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 comminuted, and I think nicely said by George that uh, the medial aspect is 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 also uh, comminuted because when we when when you think of that, then we're also Think of the, thinking of the ligamentous structures like the MPFL, which actually attach medially for for patella tracking. So this gives us a sort of global aspect of how we're going to uh, treat the sort of fractures. I think in the previous slide, we, 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 we showed that uh, options for probably the, the, the participants to think about are, you know, we've got our traditional tension band wires, uh, circulage wires, a combination of both tension band uh, wiring and also circulage. Uh, patellectomy and partial patellectomies has been mentioned, and we've also nicely brought into the, the, the picture uh, plating of the patella. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Uh, should... Yep. So these are the problems. Yeah, so, so I've, I've listed some of the problems. So I, I, I feel that there's no clear single planar surface for compression. Okay, to restore the, the extensive mechanism. So we actually need some form of multi-axial fixation. So this anterior surface comminution provides uh, you know, some problems in terms of end-to-end -end appropriation. Uh, we mentioned about the medial patella femoral ligament attachment for patella tracking. And we've talked about the uh, chondral delamination. And this is, this is one thing that, that I wanted to, 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 to think about is whether the femoral condyle can provide congruency for, for the articular surface. So having all of this put together, we're, we're thinking that we really need a very strong sort of implant to actually hold this. And what, what we, the only thing that we had, uh, other than uh, uh, thinking of a, of a mesh, mesh sort of plate, is to use this sort of calcaneal plate where we've actually removed one of the, the ears from the top there. Uh, so anterior place, it's locking, uh, 
uh, we can contour it on the table and it provides a sort of multi-axial. We must remember that this is an off-label sort of use, uh, but it, it, it probably saved us during the day. So when I superimpose this sort of picture, that's what it looks like. Uh, in terms of the surgery, it's a standard surgery that we usually do for the, the approach of the uh, patella. Uh, we didn't do a medial <coughs> Sorry. devascularization of the medial fragments. Uh, we elevated any of the delaminated articular surface and uh, temporarily uh, reduced and, and fixed the, the major fragments. Um, if you can see on the on the right hand side is the the intraoperative uh, sorry the the, the uh, image intensification pictures. So the aim of the plate was to circumferentially hold the the patella as a as a shape, which is a rounded shape. Uh, the plate provided the sort of multi axial uh, screw direction, and we 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 used it because it's got this sort of central A frame. Uh, in the middle, which provides this sort of anterior strut to, to counter tension forces during all ranges of motion during flexion of the knee. So we think it's strong enough to, to, to mobilize postoperatively. Uh, next slide, please. And on the lateral aspect, you can see that we've, we've managed to reduce some of the uh, 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 articular delamination. And we, we, we think that we can use the sort of uh, a femoral, uh, the shape of the femur to provide the sort of uh, concentric congruency of the of the articular surface of the of the of the patella, and like you mentioned also as well that these plates need to be very thin and if possible to be put as yeah. as low to the plate uh, on the patella as possible. So intraoperatively we got good range of motion, uh, and then uh, the postoperative management is roughly the same with continuous passive motion. I mean, this is a picture of, of, the, of the radiographs uh, six weeks later. Uh, but on the next case, we, we just wanted to bring, bring forward. This is, this is a courtesy of Dr. Akhdiat Fansuri, one of my, my, my partners here. Um, and he's, he's got a slightly less comminuted fracture. And we just want to bring another point uh, onto this. So procedure was the same. He used uh, 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 another calcaneal plate with a variable angle sort of locking uh, mechanism. And if you see on the next picture, the immediate postoperative x-rays. Uh, next slide, please. Yep. Uh, we can see that he's got good fixation. Uh, we've got the, 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 the thing that we want to show here is that, yes, there is an articular step in the, in the sort of fracture in the inferior pole and in the central part. If we go on. Yep. Uh, next slide. Uh, so, uh, so if you go one back. So if, if we see... The, the slide before this, we can still see that uh, that union is slightly uh, uh, delayed and the articular surface has a step there, but coming up to a year later, which is the next slide, we can see that that everything has united and, and it looks like the articular surface, at least from, from a bony perspective, it looks like it, it has united and, and the, the step is much less. So, I mean, the thing that we're, we're, we're thinking is in comminuted fractures, the, the option of a plate which looks like a mesh is, 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 is a possible option. So either a mesh plate using a 2.7 2 millimeter plate uh, in a configuration of five to five holes usually fits the, the, the patella. Um, the aim of, of surgery is mainly like, like Jane mentioned was to restore the extensor mechanism through fracture union. And I think that it's a very important as well to try and get an implant which actually helps give uh, uh, stability anteriorly and also circumferentially uh, to, to restore the shape of the patella so that it gives you the sort, right sort of ligamentous tension so that we get a, a good uh, patella tracking. And I think in terms of the articular congruity, it's difficult at most times because these are very, very, uh, you know, uh, severe injuries to the, to the articular surface and may lead to delamination. But we feel that looking at uh, one, year's, uh, one year later, that probably the concentric congruency of the, of the femoral conda may help restore at least what we see from in terms of the bony steps. Can I ask, uh, yeah. no. please, um, uh, how do you mobilize the patients in terms of rehabilitation? And I will tell you why in a minute. I'm asking this. Yeah, okay. Uh, so immediately post-stop, uh, we usually put them in a, in a brace, probably uh, in, in, um, 
in extension for a couple of weeks before we take off the, uh, the stitches and start increasing the, the range of motion uh, from, from 30, 60 to 90 degrees up to six weeks. The, the, this is, um, of course, if you don't have the ideal uh, implant, you need to be innovative and identify other potential uh, yeah. designs that would fit for the problem you are facing. Mm -hmm. Uh, one observation with this um, uh, technique that has been uh, applied here, utilizing uh, a different plate, is that your your fixation in terms of uh, the screws available is not well balanced all around mm -hmm. the patella surface, uh, and this is why I asked about the the you know rehabilitation issue. Uh, so in, in these cases that you showed, of course, eventually they healed, albeit with a bit of a, a delayed, uh, you know, healing time as uh, you indicated in the last case. But my concern would be that this plate will not be for cases where you've got four or five fragments around because your fixation is not going to be well balanced all around the, the, the uh, different parts that you need to reconstruct. Mm -hmm. Sure, yes, yeah. agreed. Sure. sure. Can I ask a question? Yes, yeah, sure. Carol, uh, why did you not use that star-shaped plate, which is now? Yeah, yeah. The, I think from, from Arthrex, there's, there's the star-shaped plate and also the arrow, arrow plate. Um, the, the reason when, when we looked at that was these, these plates are put on the anterior surface of the, of the patella and will, does not have a, a, a wing to actually cover the medial aspects. And on the other hand, we've also seen another plate uh, in, I think from Germany, I think it's, it's Koniseg uh, Implantare, which, which provides a, a plate that's like a ring shape, which, which actually is a, a, a rim sort of plate with one screw on the anterior aspect. So the benefits of that is actually it holds the, the, the plate uh, circumferentially, but has no sort of um, uh, protection from the anterior aspect. Because what, we, what, what we're worried about is during the full range of motion from zero to 130 degrees, the, the, the forces surrounding the patella are, are three-dimensional. So it's not just purely bending, uh, tension and, and compression, but there's also pull medial laterally from, from, the, from, from, from the, the, the medial aspect on, and also the lateral the aspect of the, of the patella. So, so Carol, so if you yes. don't have the ideal implant for it, uh, one option would be to actually supplement it with a circlage wire. Mm -hmm. So you do that and you supplement it with a circlage wire, which will neutralize a lot of the stresses which would be going on to your implant. Correct. I Correct. Yes. wanted to say this because we have tried this plate alone, which on table it failed. In even spite of that good fixation. So we started with the routine standard tension band and circlage and then augment this stability so they, they can help each other to give stabilize. What yeah. the doctor was asking, if you start CPM or a state machine of quadriceps, it, this, this plate may pull out. So that is the reason Peter was asking whether what is the rehabilitation program. So we have to give combine so that the plate can protect the tension band and tension band can protect the plate. And oh, this calculus plate is a very thick plate. So I don't know for, uh, for us. Yeah. All my uh, uh, Indian, very very and Indian faculty, uh, the very simple way is as you uh, suggested Sunil is to put uh, K wires and as you suggested John, uh, circlage wires circumventing the entire <laughs> stellate plate and augmenting the entire thing with normal reconstruction plates. Yeah, right. any sort of plates. Yeah. Uh, use one or uh, create a cross or create uh, with three and augment the entire construct so that all combination stays together. Correct. Yeah. Water will give a tremendous amount of vascularity Correct. and it will heal eventually. As Kherul demonstrated, six months it will show up, but one year, one and a half year, it will stay there. You know? So... Can I ask a question? question sure, sure. Shomitra first, then George. Now, it's a question to the panel. Now, uh, as you all know that when you open up these structures, they look far worse than what, he, what it shows on X-ray. Uh, so, uh, can you do a routine CT scan for these structures? Does that help? I just, well, that's for something I mentioned. 
for some of these comminuted fractures, it's actually worthwhile getting a CT. Yep. Yeah, that, uh, that's, that's, that's correct, because uh, there, there was a paper saying that if you get a CT uh, for these severely comminuted fractures, it, it, it changes your, your, your classification and it changes your surgical procedure in about 44%. So, Carol, question to you. Even in non-comminuted patella uh, in Malaysia, you are doing that now? Uh, is that what you are suggesting? Uh no, no, we're, we're, we're saying that if it's a simple transverse fracture, we still do the, the tension band wiring. Uh, but in yeah. severely comminuted fractures, the idea that we're trying to say is that if we, can, if we can put a single construct which is connected to each other, which provides stability anteriorly and circumferentially, that would give added benefit rather than putting in separate implants. So, sure. Should we? Yes, George. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Carol, when you put this, if you if you do put a circle arch of these community fractures, isn't it very difficult to hold the fragments in a reduction position? Oh, uh, de definitely. I, I find that when you when you're when you're tightening things up, it's yeah. very difficult to actually hold it in 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 place. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why we 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 opted for for sort of. Uh, a one single single implant with polyaxial sort of fixation because uh, uh, a circular wire gives sort of a circumferential uh, uh, tensioning, uh, which, is, which is probably, uh, 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 what do you call it, parallel to the, to, to the radius. Uh, whereas when we put in these screws in, in various angles, then it's, it's in, in line with the screws. And when there's a lip of the plate that's actually holding it, that gives it a bit of extra strength. Okay. Yes, sir, you are in? Okay. Thank you. Uh, Harpal? Yeah, I'm a uh, slight, little bit surprised. Nobody's talked of small fragment screws or metacarpal screws to fix interfrag screws and then do a circlage wire or tension band augmented with screws on board, you because that's what we normally do because we do not have access to, we, we never did plates for the patella. Yeah. So in addition to K wires, uh, mini fragment or small fragment screws is a, uh, a done thing, absolutely. And in fact, some people use uh, calculated screws and pass uh, circlage wire through that. Yeah. Even that technique has been described and people are widely using it. Any more questions? If not, let's go ahead. Jane, are you around? Thank you. That's yours. Thanks, Kairul. Good case. Thank you very much. Um, so this definitely put me out of my com comfort zone. We don't see a, a huge amount of gunshots over in the UK. So I'm grateful for all the <laughs> panel's advice. So he accidentally, uh, I to use that term loosely, got shot in his own house. Um, so that's what he came in with. So was it his own gun or somebody else came and shot him? Somebody else came and shot him. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. so he comes in uh, not on my own call over somebody else's on call and, and as described in the UK because of Meckham's injury, he'd have a, a major trauma CT with a bastion protocol. So he gets a CT angio anyway. Uh, and that's uh, verbatim what was reported. So there's obviously a discontinu discontinuity of the popliteal artery. However, you can see three vessel runoff. His foot is sensate uh, and it's warm. And the advice from the vascular surgeons on call was that as he's got three vessel runoff and his foot is warm, um, not to do anything overnight. Jess, sir, you want to suggest something? Yeah, they got a vascular opinion. I think uh, uh, basically some kind of an external fixator will help to at least stabilize the fragments. External fixator at this point of time. Yeah, uh, can I come in there? Yes, John, ask. So I think you have to be careful with these because even though you may have three vessel runoff, especially the gunshot wound, you may have a laceration in the vessel and this will suddenly bleed on you and it's going to be a disaster. So I think in spite of uh, uh, there being uh, some runoff in the distal vessels, I would be inclined to explore it and make sure there's no major vascular injury there. 
Yeah, so that's definitely our, our thoughts as well. I think sometimes the vascular surgeons are coming at it from an elective vascular surgery point yeah. of view, and it's very different in trauma. So with an injury like this, I think you have to presume there is a vascular injury. Uh, and my learning point for this is sometimes the CT angio can actually falsely reassure you. Yeah, I agree. So what, what we've tended to do now, I don't, uh, you can go to the next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah. So well, what we found actually coming from uh, evidence in supercondylars in children and for actually the upper limb, that if we put a SAT probe on, so you've got, this is the same patient, is injured side and is non-injured side. If there's any difference in either the caliber of the SAT trace or in the SATs, it's really simple. It's definitely cheaper than a CT angio. Then we know that there is a vascular problem. So we've now got a definite 3C uh, gunshot. What, what, what now? We are lucky we don't see. <laughs> gunshot. No. Oh. Some part of the country, maybe. Yeah. No, we see a few of these, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Hello, Patna is... Patna is... Like even, the in, students. <laughs> even Punjab has a number of gunshots. Seriously? Yeah. Okay, so you guys can take John, you and Harpal. What so, as, like I said earlier, I think it would need uh, debridement, uh, exploring the vessel, doing whatever is necessary with it, and a temporary external fixator stabilization. Now, there's controversy as to what you do first, whether you do the last first or First, I think uh, that depends on, uh, we tend to just put on the external fixator and then let the vascular guys get on with the vascular part of it. Yeah, so we've got some quite good national guidelines in terms of, in terms of order. Um, yeah. And uh, what we would do first is uh, do a temporary shunt. So shunt you yeah, go, no, the, go to the, the right. next slide, please. That's the British Plastic Surgeon's recommendation, I believe. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so this, this is what we did. So it goes to theatre with consultant vascular, consultant uh, or Felix and consultant plastics. It's quite upsetting when you can look through the leg and see the vascular <laughs> surgeon through the plastic <laughs> <laughs> um, so got shunted straight away and this is another learning point the off the shelf shunts are not long enough to bridge yeah. across that length so the vascular surgeon had to make his own shunt using like a, a javid shunt for the neck and an umbilical pediatric catheter um, so we shunt first of all then we do our prophylactic fasciotomies got debrided with the plastic surgeons, then we put our X-fix on, and then when it's stable, the vascular surgeons came in to do their definitive vascular repair, uh, and then we vac the wound. So they were my II films. Just one question on that, Jen. Uh, yeah. So you put the shunt in and then you do uh, X fix as stabilization in this stage. Yeah. Yeah. And then they go on and do their definitive vascular surgery. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, actually, what was interesting, and still to this day, this chap has not had his popliteal artery explored or tied off, and okay. he, ha he hasn't bled. Okay, fair enough. If you explode, okay. So when you did your debridement in the vessel, isn't it? Harpal, you are asking something? Harpal? So, yeah. So, what's your, Jane, what's your antibiotic protocol for a gunshot? Do you add metronidazole along with uh, aminoglycoside, or it's just the gram positive cafazolin cover that you give? Uh, so, it's no different to our normal open fractures. And like I say, we really don't see many gunshots. So, they get a broad spectrum antibiotic in the emergency department with tetanus cover, and their initial debridement is usually uh, augmentin and gentamicin. And then they then stay on coamoxiclav until their definitive closure. And then we give them tigerplanin to cover hospital bugs and another shot of gentamicin. And once all the wounds are closed, all antibiotics are stopped. So uh, one more thing about the fasciotomies, is that dependent on the time interval or you just do it anyway? No, for any reperfusion, we would, we would do prophylactic yeah, If it's done more or less immediately? Yeah, and this, this wasn't. Remember, he came in the night before and then okay, the yeah, team so, sat yeah, him overnight. It. So it, it was about okay, so. eight hours. 
Okay, so that definitely would need to do the first shot. So what do you do? So, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, what's happening next? So uh, the vascular surgeons did an amazing job and uh, reperfused his foot, which was great. But then the patient was like, "Well, I, I want my leg saved now. Uh, please, can you please can you reconstruct me?" And I, I don't know what to do. So then it really comes back to all the principles we've discussed before is to try and get his articular block as good as possible. Uh, obviously need to think about infection. So we need robust soft tissue coverage, which was provided with bilateral gastrox, and then try and bridge the articular block uh, to the diaphysis and like the patella case, try and restore his extensor mechanism. So he's got his uh, joint and extensor mechanism fixed back with um, lots of mini fragment plates. We, we had the EVOS set come in for it. Um, I've bridged him out to length and I've tried to fill the defect uh, with some local antibiotics uh, cement. So when you finished your, uh, so they, did they do a vascular reconstruction or not? So they, they did that on, on day one, after so I'd done, done the X-Fix. Okay. He's already okay. had that, yeah. So they already done a bypass, they bypassed the injured segment. So whatever they have done, Jen, on day one, is the final thing, is it, as far as the vascular thing is concerned? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Because so the shunt, the shunt is really unstable. It's just tied in with a hand tie, and it came out at least three times when I was putting the X-Fix on. So it, you need to have something definitive done. Yeah. So honestly, in my head, I thought this is definitely going to get infected. So I don't really need to worry what I'm going to do with the bone because he's going to end up with an amputation. Um, but he didn't. His soft tissue is healed. His extensor mechanism was okay. So now I had to get to the stage where we had to remove the cement and graft him, which was difficult. Um, his soft tissues at the front were very poor. Uh, so we went in from the back, uh, took out his cement, routinely take uh, samples as discussed as we're doing a revision. Fortunately, they were all negative. Um, I thought that he definitely needed a uh, bone graft so took some rear, which we managed to do with him still prone from the other side, um, but that didn't really give enough. So we took his fibula as well and buttressed that back with some supplemental fixation. And we still needed some artificial bone graft as well. Wow, that must, uh, how many hours did it take the surgery? So, so did it you wasn't have surgery as well, standby, when you did this posterior plating? Did I? Uh, so I did it in conjunction with a plastic surgeon. I say we do a lot of routine. And for safety, I'd informed the vascular surgeons that I was taking him back, but they weren't there. Because if you think about it, we were actually going through virgin territory from the back. That's why we didn't want to come in and lift a gastroc, because his uh, bypass graft was tunneled straight there. So actually from the back, it, it was the only thing that was difficult was because of all the uh, bullets, everything had stuck down a little bit. So once we could see, uh, this is what we did. Um, took his X fix off, and uh, this is him at 10 months now. Uh, it, so if I can ask you, Jen, what are these tiny plates doing at some point? So these are the grafts which is getting fixed to the parent bone, or what are they, these small tiny plates doing? All those tiny plates at the front. The initial reconstruction. Try, yes, to try and restore his uh, his extensor mechanism because the whole of his anterior tibia was in in fragments. Yeah. Jane, uh, you wouldn't consider a fi ring fixator here. Uh, yes, I, I don't know why I didn't. I think it's because I didn't want to bridge his knee for any longer because he's had his X fix on for so long. I wanted to get his knee going and I didn't think that I'd be able to span that enough. No, just in tibia, you know, fixator, ring fixator, just in the tibia. And bone yeah. transport. Oh, I remember why. Because, of course, he's had his vascular bypass. So his anastomosis is all his vascular anatomy is very, very distorted. So I was a little bit worried that I was going to play clapunk with my fine wires. Yes, so, sir. So, the posterior, yeah. so you went through a posterior medial approach? Uh, a true posterior approach. So, so between the two heads of the gastro. 
Now remember, he's got no gastrox because his gastrox have actually been swung round to cover what his sides? defect at the front. What sides? Both sides, took both his gastrox. That's interesting. Carol, you want Which, to... Yeah, uh, Jane, is, is, am I correct in saying that he's also had an uh, ACL reconstructed as well? A revision ACL, yes. Or, or it was that... Or revision. So was that uh, secondary to all his injuries or, or was it prior to the injury? No, prior to the injury. So he had oh, one ACL, okay. then he okay. had a revision ACL and, um, and the knee surgeon was very upset that the gunshot had actually <laughs> shot out his ACL. <laughs> okay, all right, okay. <laughs> uh, so this is him now. Uh, he can definitely straight leg raise. He has some range of motion in his knee, which he's happy with. He walked into clinic and, it, and is pain free. Only one screw is broken, which is good. His biggest issue is his fixed Aquinas. And that's, that's the trouble. And, and looking back, uh, he had a, a foot drop earlier on, although it was sensei. I, I don't know what I could have done something different, I think, to improve that. So now you can think of fixator and correct this Aquinas gradually or what uh, correct his limb length discrepancy at the same time? Yeah, I thought about that as well, but then I'm going to have to do a, a, a distal, so it's too high risk. So he's going to have his Aquinas sorted out first for my foot and ankle colleague. And if at that stage he still doesn't like his limb length discrepancy, I'll have to lengthen him. I don't Why know how. Shorten the other side. <laughs> the That's other side. actually quite a good point. Yeah, maybe we should do Just that. Just two centimeters. Yeah. Peter, any questions? You have been quiet for so long. No, no, no. Um, it's, it's good to see that all the principles uh, here were applied from uh, day one in terms of uh, revascularization, uh, bridging, dealing with the infection, issues, and then trying to reconstruct at a later stage the bone component of the injury. Uh, Jane, I, 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 I would have thought he had a CT and everything is united following the graft uh, application. I haven't re CT'd him to see if it's united. Um, I completely agree for the other cases uh, that you know, CTs can be helpful. There's so much metal there. I don't think my radiologists are going to be able to fully tell me whether it's united or not. I'm working on the principle that actually, as none of the metal work has failed, there must be some union there. JP, would you do anything differently in the Philippines? JP? Well, yeah, I think with this kind of case, I, I pretty much looks looks great. Um, we wouldn't have access to a lot of the same things. Um, we would do the spanning fixator and have TCVS come in, probably keep him on a fixator for some time afterwards because TCVS doesn't want the repairs to be messed around with, and then go on and do the stage reconstruction. And so on. I think this is an awesome job. Yeah. That's wonderful. Fantastically done, Jane. Yeah. Good job. Let's move on now. Uh, so, George, you're on, George. This is your case. Yes, I'm around. I'm around. Yeah. Okay. So, tell us. Okay, so this is a 27 year old male who fell from a motorcycle at fairly high speed. And he was brought 200 kilometers from the place where he fell after application of a uh, plaster. For Paris back slab, he was brought into Chennai, where I practice. So, can we go forward now? Yep. So, this is the clinical picture on admission. And um, uh, here, normally, I will open these blisters and apply silver sulfonide. So, maybe you can say, others can say why, why they do or why they do not. So uh, if I can ask you, George, mm -hmm. uh, two types of blisters, you and me know, sepsis mm. and hemorrhagic, would you open both of them? Actually, yes, both. Any panelists differing on this? Yes, Harpal? See, uh, I asked Jane also particularly about this. Uh, we had a discussion amongst us in the orthopedics and with the plastic surgeon colleagues. This is a godsend dressing, which is sterile. So try not to break them. And if they get broken while doing the dressings or something, then we just cover them with the sterile dressing. We never open them up or aspirate them on our own. 
that's the protocol i follow in my department yeah. okay harpa let me stop you there is there a difference between a serious uh, fracture blister or hemorrhagic fracture blister uh, where there is blood right you are meaning to say there Correct. those are dead blisters right Correct. Uh, for both it is the same because uh, they don't differentiate between the two actually yes so, sir yeah it only indicates the severity of injury to the soft tissues so there's no difference I, we don't meddle with this blisters we just leave it like that john yeah so there's a difference in that a blood blister implies a full thickness dermal involvement so it's more or less communicating with the fracture so you have to be a little more careful about uh, aspirating them outside because there's a risk of introducing infection but we tend not to do uh, just like harpal and um, jay we don't tend to aspirate or drain these blisters we just would just put on a spanning fixator in these bad proximal tibial fractures and i think within a few days they heal just as well whether you aspirate them or not sunil what will you do same as john we always do a, a spanning and don't puncture at all we don't do uh, it peter what does the literature suggest types of blisters how should you attack them well what george said about uh, the presence of blood there it's quite mm. suspicious and risky about uh, complete uh, the 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 demarcation and communication of the epidermis with yes, the fine tissue so i would be really, really cautious to um, when I, i see this kind of picture that definitely you you don't want to disturb it because then you just open everything to the outside environment you just cover it uh, when there is no blood that's just superficial and there are two schools of thought one is try to aspirate them cover them and that means that uh, the the epidermis and the surrounding soft tissues will settle early a bit quicker yeah quicker rather than waiting waiting until it will burst start getting some healing and then going so uh in in uh, in my place when there's quite a, a a a large volume we we aspirate them carefully and then we cover them and we don't look at it for about 3 4 days and then we, when we go back things that have settled and i think like that you can um um get back to your preoperative planning faster than waiting until they will go down Okay has, so has anyone on? done a study to actually see if the healing times differ if you aspirate them or you don't there there is a review of literature on this there are two types of blisters serious no no forget the blood blisters that we won't aspirate at all I'm talking so blood about blood blisters they were aspirated because it will lead to full thickness exactly. effect uh, serious blisters you can aspirate dress them uh, preferred dressing is silver sulfadiazine Yeah, but is there any difference in healing time between not aspirating them or aspirating them? So serous, if you don't aspirate, takes three weeks up to if you aspirate and dress so. seven to ten days. So that's a there is a Canadian study uh, on this. Um, I don't remember the author, but uh, someone from Canada. Worth has... actually doing it and checking it again. Yeah. Yeah. Shall we proceed? Uh, George, let's go yeah. ahead. So that's the standard protocol: span and scan. Can we go ahead? Yes. So here, the the actually the point I wanted to bring out was that there was an avulsion of the tibial tuberosity. So it means that the quadriceps expansion is compromised. So the question that arises for me is now, uh, when you do this fixation, how are you going to manage this multi-fragmentary fracture of the tibial tuberosity? So anybody would like to? Then you want to take this. Yes. Can I can I ask a question for George? Yes. Yes. Um, if you look at the picture, the clinical picture, and we've seen this in a couple of cases, the avulsed tuberosity fragment is directly under the area where you have the blood-filled fracture blister, and I think what happens is the displaced fragment here, right over there, right, mm. and that avulsed area, the avulsed bone is actually pushing on the skin and causing it to devascularize even more. So, question is: Is there any role for early Trying to reduce that fragment to try to decompress that skin, and maybe percutaneously fixing it, or just you know, avoid um, preventing more damage to the skin and the surface. 
I didn't do that, so I will leave it to somebody else to answer. <clears throat> Sunil, you want to take this? Yeah. <clears throat> if after once the skin, everything is healed, then uh, I would use the two plates on the one on the medial, one on the lateral. And I will put a, with the tooth washer, I'll put a, this in tuberosity fragment with a lax screw posterior going down obliquely exactly. So that it will take care of it. It should not be seen on the skin. So that you have to plan in properly that that fragment of the tuberal tuberosity will remain there and okay. it has to be lag screw with the tooth washer. Otherwise, it will come up. Sunil, yeah. Sunil uh, if two things. One, through which incision will you go for that uh, fixation of the tibial tuberosity? One, the, anterior, the, anterior, the anterolateral incision for the tibial, uh, the lateral tibial condyle, which I am taking it, mm -hmm. little bit extend it so that we can just go on because it's after. Make sure it is everything is soft because the soft skin you may require two weeks or even 14 days, 15 days, whatever it is. You okay. have to wait till your skin should be retracted. And you don't require much for the reduction. You can use the same towel clip with the footprint, less footprint, and reduce that tuberosity fragment and put a 6.5 screw with the tooth washer so okay. that it will not avulge out. And then uh, on the medial side, a uh, small radius buttress plate which can be on the medial side. And lateral side, a small raft plate. Raft, actually, raft is not required. If there is a depressed fragment, then raft will definitely submeniscal uh, dissection and elevation of the depressed fragment. All these structures came. Okay, uh, so in this patient, although yeah. the, re the reconstruction, the fragment looks simple, like a single fragment. It was actually in multiple pieces, and it cannot yeah. take. It so you have, to, you have to plan that for the like a Lowe's, Lowe's uh, classification. You have to plan each fragment must have a each no i'm talking about the tubular tibial tuberosity it cannot take a screw so you can use a small plate you can use a yeah, small plate it. and to put two screws one in and one uh, one part of the plate on the tibial tuberosity and one part of the plate on the second hole will be on the tibia so that it will buttress it properly yeah i think so just to add to jp's comment about the skin tenting i think it's something you need to look out for because if that it doesn't look so displaced in this particular case, but sometimes it could be literally rotated and pointing under the skin. And those are situations where I would agree that it's important to try and reduce it in the first sitting so that it doesn't continue to uh, press against the skin and cause further damage. Yeah. Or you have to see the apex of the medial. Yeah. See the apex of the medial condyle. And plan your incision exactly. You should buttress that apex. You make sure that your for last buttress screw is just exactly distal to the apex. That's very important. So you have to plan according to your 3D CT. If it is in posterior medial, you take a posterior medial incision. If it is medial, take a medial. If it is anterior medial, you can take anterior medial. So that yeah. way you have to plan your incision. Okay. Can we proceed? Yeah. Okay. So we discussed this. Okay. So this is about two weeks after the external fixator was applied and after the blisters had settled down and the wrinkle sign had appeared and then we were going into the fixation. Can you proceed? So this is the usual medial approach and as uh, pointed out by Sunil, you know, the, the medial side be a little bit far away from the tuberosity. So it's difficult to access from this side. So my plan was also, like Sunil said, to access it through the lateral approach. So on the, lateral, on the lateral side, you're much closer to the tuberosity and by extending it a bit, you could get there. But after having exposed it, I didn't find it possible to put in a screw. And I was really worried to put in an additional uh, plate in this particular patient because it would have needed going further up. I have done it in another case, which I didn't put here. But so I thought that here we could use a tension band wire because tension band wire is commonly used if you have an avulsion of the of the tuberosity, though this is not a common, common injury in adults, a, a rather uncommon injury in adults. So in this particular situation, I thought it would be wise to put a tension band and pass the wire around underneath the ligament and patella, and we would be able to mobilize the patient fairly easily. Can we proceed? Yeah. So what happened is, yeah, this is uh, six months after fixation. As you can see, when you're in the standing view, yeah, okay, you can go to the clinical picture, that's fine. Yeah, but 
in, in between this time, on the lateral side, there was some, there was a wound dehiscence in a place where I found I had, I've done three such cases now, and I've always found that it's exactly at the same point where the wound will open. It's just lateral to the tuberosity. So I was looking at what could possibly be the reason for this. Can we go forward? And this is the blood supply of the proximal tibia. And I think perhaps that the, this anterior tibial recurrent artery, it gets damaged when we approach it from the lateral side. So the point is that, you know, in, in these young patients who have these fractures, we are always thinking that in the later period of life, they may need a total knee replacement. And in the early days, uh, these used to be approached to this Mercedes-Benz incision that they were all found to be very uh, difficult and cause devascularization of the proximal part of the tibia. And that's why we have tried to keep the incisions as far away as possible. But uh, I wonder how, how would be a good idea to approach this tibial tuberosity, whether it's still from the lateral side or whether it would be wiser to put a medial parapetalar incision like a TKR incision to expose these fractures. That's the question I have. That's, that's probably the end of this presentation. Sushut? Uh, yeah, there are many questions uh, which uh, a lot of people are having. So can I take yeah. uh, Is it possible? Or shall we go ahead with the case? And end of the cases we take, because there are many, many questions. There are around uh, 6,000 people watching us and shooting questions at me. <laughs> but what time are we going on till? Uh, we'll go till uh, we finish. <laughs> <laughs> Already so, been too long. So let's take uh, Peter's and uh, Sunil's case, and then we'll uh, take to the questions. So Peter, this is you. Yeah. So <clears throat> you can see here from the radiographs. Uh, just give me one second because I've lost you now. There we are. So we're talking about um, an injury to a male patient, 37 years of age, sustained this injury that you see on the x-rays um, following a motorbike accident. It was a closed injury uh, and there was no neurological deficit present. And uh, you, you may appreciate the injury to the lateral tibial plateau on the lateral side, you can see that there is something happening on the back of um, uh, the, the um, articular block of um, the tibia. And of course, you, you know that what you see is not actually the extent of the damage. And naturally, one what would do is to request a CT scan in this case having a splint uh, the leg, the soft tissues seemed to be uh, okay. There were no blisters or any uh, signs of um, uh, concern at the time. Let's go, let's go to the next slide. And you can see here some cuts, uh, the coronal, the axial, the sagittal, and right now you can appreciate a bit more the extent of the injury uh, not just to the lateral tibial plateau, but also you can appreciate the injury to um, the posterior aspect of the articular surface. Yeah. Uh, any questions to any uh, from any panelists? Please raise your hand so I can unmute that person. Uh, if you have any question, just raise your hand and uh, I can ask that panelist to ask the question to Peter. Anyone from the panelist, any questions? At this point in time, if not, let me go ahead. So this is your 3D image showing, Peter. This is a 3D image and you can appreciate a bit more the extent of the injury, um, the, a bit of depression over the central uh, segments of the articular surface and the two fragments over the posterior articular surface. Uh, and of course, when you analyze the pattern, the issues in terms of uh, uh, the presence of depression, the different uh, fracture fissures lines, then you need to start 
planning how you will uh, manage this fracture, how you will stabilize it. Okay, so JP, uh, that's the CT uh, and we have seen the X-ray. How will you take this further? What approach uh, and what are we dealing with? You need to unmute. Yeah. Very, very, very good case shown by the professor. The x-rays look benign, but when you take the CT scans, you actually see a lot of the problems. Uh, you have a depressed central area and a posterior and split. So I think this case might need to be approached from a posterior lateral approach uh, using the same way, opening the fracture site, lifting up the depressed articular fragments, and then maybe putting a buttress on from the back. Uh, as well. I'm not sure if you would consider doing a rim plating on the posterior part uh, to control at least the, the posterior part of the plateau. Okay. Uh, Carol, you want to suggest anything else? Yeah. Um, I think uh, the, the, the posterior area of the fracture extends both uh, laterally and also medially and it's it's pretty distal um so the what approach uh, yeah i i'm i'm thinking it probably needs uh, uh it, it probably needs to go through two approaches uh probably one sort of uh, 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 uh an anterolateral sort of approach to approach the 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 lateral fragment anteriorly which can be pulled where the plate can actually be swung backwards and held from the front um, and then through a, a, a sort of posture medial sort of approach to to address the rim of the of the of the medial aspect as well. Yeah, Shomitra, you raised your hand. Unmute, please. Unmute, please. Yeah, uh, I think the injury here is a lateral column and both posture columns, uh, posture lateral and posture medial. Um, so. Uh, we need a postomedial approach to uh, address the postomedial fragment, uh -huh. and I think we need an approach uh, to address the postlateral and the lateral together. So I think there's a frost approach is going to uh, be very useful in this case where you can address the both columns together. Okay, so let's go on. Uh, Peter, show us what you have suggested. So just to um, remind uh, everyone uh, the new concept in terms of uh, the classification of these injuries uh, by Kafli and uh, Joseph Shaske, I'm sure you're all familiar with the with this paper that um, takes this virtual equator line uh, between the um, uh, uh, fibular collateral ligament and the medial collateral ligament and then divides uh, the coronal uh, image of the tibial plateau uh, into four quadrants, the anterior lateral, the anterior medial, posterior lateral, and the posterior medial. And based on uh, this classification, it was clear that we're talking about two fragments to the posterior lateral column, posterior medial, and the anterior lateral column as well. So we've got- Peter, can I, can, I, can I stop you there, please, for a second? Yeah. Because a uh, lot of Indian delegates are aware about uh, loose classi classification. But this is a modification of uh, Schatzker classification by Kufri. Uh, and he has drawn not only uh, one line randomly, but he has connected fibular collateral ligament with medial collateral ligament. So that on a CT, you can differentiate uh, this particular quadrant into a posterior coronal plane fractures. So that's how this classification differs from a loose classification, which is uh, very popular nowadays. So uh, again, back to you, Peter. Yeah. So we we know now that uh, as it was discussed that we are dealing with three columns here, and the issue is um, how we can address the uh, two columns posteriorly. Uh, the anterolateral column is an easier approach and an easier fragment to deal with. Uh, next slide. Now, uh, just to remind everyone that what we see in this case is not something uncommon. Maybe in the past, we did not appreciate that much the existence of these uh, shearing uh, element fractures of the tibial plateau. And if you look into the literature, uh, 
they are not that uncommon. Almost uh, one uh, in uh, three fractures present with uh, some kind of uh, an injury to uh, other the posterior medial or the posterior lateral column of the articular surface. Next slide. In terms of uh, the fracture treatment goals, again, uh, we just need to follow the principles, restore the mechanical axis and everything else. And in terms of the approaches of the TBL plateau, next slide. Just to remind uh, everyone, uh, we've got uh, the modified posterior lateral approach that has been uh, uh, highlighted in the literature, the direct posterior, next slide and the posterior medial and the posterior lateral approaches that uh, allow you to get uh, good access to these um, shearing fragments of uh, the posterior articular surface of um, the plateau. And then uh, we also could consider the fibula head osteotomy where you take down uh, the head of the fibula and, and it gives you a better access to the lateral and the posterior lateral tibial plateau fractures. Next slide. Uh, we also uh, have been uh, exposed to this reversed L-shape approach. Uh, as you can see here, next slide. So in this case, uh, I'll just take you through how I manage this um, fracture. Next slide. So you can see the position of the patient, a supine on an OSI table that I use for pelvic reconstruction. As you know, this table is from carbon fiber and therefore you don't have any issue how to screen and how to visualize what you want to visualize during uh, your uh, surgery. GA, Foley catheter, tourniquet prone. Uh, you, you, can, you need to place a soft uh, bolster underneath uh, the thigh. And you can see here a reversal shape approach next, uh, which allows you um, to get good access. You can see this, the cephalan end uh, of um, the incision going across to the lateral side, a full fasciocutaneous flap, exposure of uh, the fracture. And you can see here from the back, utilizing uh, one of the pin from the Hoffman three to elevate the depressed central articular segment under direct um, image control and then manipulation of the fragments to try to reduce them. In the first instance, the posterolateral fragment was addressed with uh, a small DCP and then a T-plate was, uh, was uh, applied to address the posterior medial fragment, as you can see. And then the patient uh, was turned uh, supine uh, and we proceeded with the construction of the anterolateral column uh, under image guidance, guidance to uh, like screws were inserted from the anterior medial to the medial um, column with two screws, as you can see with um, a reduction forceps aligning everything. And then a lateral plate was uh, applied and the lateral plates to utilize the whole fixation. These are the post-op radiographs. And you can see then the one year follow up uh, healing of the fracture utilizing this um, uh, plan and these two approaches. Next slide. And, and then a bit about uh, the literature that when you've got posterior colonial fractures, uh, if you don't address them directly by fixation and buttressing, then there is a high risk of uh, failure. Uh, to lose reduction if you just try to do it from anterior middle or anterior laterally. And how, uh, just a snapshot of some papers, how utilizing this posterior lateral um, ap approach or posterior medial, you can get good results and good outcomes um, over a immediate follow up of two years. And to conclude, that when you see these sharing fractures, you must be familiar with the posterior approaches. You need to identify the right timing to identify any impaction injuries to uh, elevate them. And if you do that and you follow the principles, good, outco uh, good outcomes can be expected. I think a fantastic demonstration of a very effective uh, approach, Peter. Any questions from the panel? Please unmute and ask.
If not, shall we just go ahead? Sunil, it's your case. Okay, Sunil. So uh, we get a lot of these patients with the treated with conservative. They, they don't see the depression and what. So this patient came to me after four months. Go ahead. Yeah. Can you see uh, the, the joint injured on the posterior? That's Peter was telling me that it's a posterior lateral and posterior medial both. You can see, you can appreciate the double shadow. That means there is a depression on the medial condyle, which is very rare. Just split and then go into the posterior. So it is extremely difficult to correct that. So that fellow was outside, was operated, and after two, three months, he came down. Next, we did a, this is the split on the medial side. This is on the lateral side. So what is the plan is the CT is must for proper planning and approach the restore the articular congruity, stable fixation and associate ligamentous injury was expected. So if you see now, this is the uh, a depress on the lateral side as well. And the posterior medial was obviously it was gone down because of the angle of the 74 and this is the CT. Anybody wants to suggest anything? Or we'll just go for the case. Want of time. Uh, John, unmute, please. John, if you want to say something, just unmute. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, these are ones which would need intra-articular osteotomies. Uh, I think uh, here you would have to approach both sides. I would do the medial side with the medial incision, go to the original fracture level elevate it and then uh, fix and buttress that. And the lateral side, I would probably make an anterolateral window, which will allow you to see the depression, elevate it, if necessary, graft it and fix it. So I think we've done a lot of these intra-articular osteotomies in the proximal tibia for patients presenting late in various shapes and sizes. And uh, I think they do very, quite well. I think in, especially the ones which haven't been uh, already operated on before and uh, are not particularly stiff. So they do pretty well. George, you want to suggest something? George? I, uh, Sushut, I don't have experience with these. None of them come to me. No, we've done quite a few. Uh, can, can I ask uh, one question, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, in these sharing fractures, it's not uncommon to have uh, injuries to the meniscus yeah. when you leave them. And uh, my question to Sunil is whether he gets routinely an MRI scan as well to appreciate an injury to, um, and whether, or would, would he deal with this at the later stage, if that's the case? The wishful thinking is that to get an MRI and CT both, but uh, mostly in India, we don't get MRI on the fresh fractures, but it is really a good thing to see it. But the financial problem of the in India, you get lots of problems. So either they have to give a CT or they have to give a MRI. So we have to choose MRI for because we deal with bone. So if at all there is a ligamentous uh, any injury, we can deal it later. But at least we can reconstruct the joint. That's the most important principle. So and if all meniscal is entrapped, we can just take it off or suture whatever you want to. Okay, Sunil, shall we go ahead? Yeah. yeah. Are behind now, yes. We have started doing the 3D printer, you know, all these uh, put into a 3D printer and we can plan it. And that will give you uh, the exactly where you want to do the osteotomy, where you want to uh, play with your plates, where do you want to put a plate and so that we can have and uh, just reconstruct on table before your surgery. And then it, and it makes our life very easy. So we plan that and then reconstruct the articular surface, correction of the deformities and restore the mechanical axis. That is very important. What Peter was stressing on the mechanical axis is very important. Next. So uh, by stage by uh, we uh, put a, a tricortical graft because it was very difficult to mobilize, especially on the lateral side. So lateral side, we prefer uh, in this patient, we usually don't do it, but now we started with the what Professor Kretek has suggested to go up a fibular osteotomy as well as the, uh, the IT band we can chop off. And then we, we this patient with the frosh approach. Next. 
So lateral popliteal nerve uh, will come next. This is Lobenhofer's. So we initially uh, did with the lateral popliteal nerve, then we did the fibular osteotomy, and then uh, went into a reconstruction on the lateral side as well as we just want to stabilize first with the realign and then fix it. So we uh, yeah, okay. instructed it. We did the correct osteotomy and then opened the wedge and the, with the uh, lamina spreader and osteotome, it kept it and then we opened up on the lateral side because we just going more on the lateral side. It was suggested the split was easy to reconstruction on the lateral side, but it was more difficult on the lateral side. So we went into a lateral side. Usually it should go from the medial side and then we can correct all everything and realign. Go ahead. These are all intraoperative pictures. Temporary screw fixation, temporary just to not to lose and then go for the medial side. We can fix this medial after elevation and then go on to the lateral side. And then we fix the, reattach the fibular head back to the fibula so that we uh, align that lateral collateral, the biceps tendon, everything comes in picture and so that it realigns well. And these are the clinical picture after that. And it's a frost approach, we can see it. So the osteotomy should be planned. And now the 3D printer, we can plant actually on, on table before you plan it. You can have a lot of time you can take and discuss with this. Okay. Fantastically done. Any questions for Sunil? Um, yes, John. No, just a couple of, yeah. So when you say frosh approach, that doesn't involve a fibula osteotomy. So I think the fibula osteotomy is a kind of modification of the frosh. Actually, gone down deep, deep gone down. So, because the lateral condyle was yeah, yeah. so we we use that approach where we do the osteotomy and also do posterior and anterior approach to the same side laterally. I, I, I didn't find uh, it was very easy. Not not easy because it was all old. So these old ones are never easy. Okay. Yeah. So we have to plan it. Uh -huh. But once the, it is taken incision, so we can't change. So we did. Uh, yeah, yeah. So the old ones are never easy. They always. Uh, my, my purpose of putting this case was to see uh, Peter had excellently demonstrated the uh, loose approach, which is inverted L. You demonstrated a modification of frosh by keratic, which is fibular osteotomy in a difficult case. Let's move on uh, on this. Uh, of course, uh, the bottom line is we must now look at multi columnar, multi uh, plating options. Uh, and as you rightly suggested, uh, Sunil, yeah. uh, the medial condyle, uh, we have to see whether uh, where that beak is pointing to, <clears throat> towards. For example, this was a, uh, of course, a posterior uh, medial uh, scene here, but there is a huge uh, condyle on the medial side, which is seen. Fracture blisters, we have talked about them. Uh, so uh, we did, uh, because the medial condyle was intact and the beak was pointing uh, anteromedially. So this was a plate which was placed in addition to the primary plate, which was which is lateral, a temporary uh, medial plate placed anteromedially um, till uh, we avoid uh, collapse on the medial side. We can remove it uh, after some time. That removal can be from six weeks to three months once bony consolidation is seen radiologically and uh, we uh, achieve that good axis of the tibia uh, and a good functional movement. Uh, posterior medial, we have seen this is uh, Lou, who is a good friend and he has described the uh, approach uh, which uh, Peter <coughs> demonstrated, which goes uh, right up to the lateral side, but that posterior lateral plate always has to be very tiny and obliquely placed. We can't put like a uh, frosh approach, a vertical plate there. So if there is a tiny intact fragment posterolaterally, this approach is good. Otherwise an independent approach as uh, John, you have been talking about or Sunil, you have been talking about. Uh, Lou himself prefers a floppy lateral position. If it's a very tiny fragment, I can do it in supine or a posterior approach. So another quick example of this uh, posterior medial uh, fragment 
uh, posterior medial independent plating and a lateral plating independent columnar approach uh, to achieve this. Uh, there are various ways to uh, deal with this comminuted additional medial fragment. If it's a dead, dead medial fragment, put a dead medial plate as is here uh, or here. Uh, if it's a more coronal plane fracture, then you have to take a posterior approach yeah. as Sunil has demonstrated or as Peter, you have demonstrated which is a posterior approach and a posterior medial and posterior lateral plating. Uh, very innocuous looking fracture, uh, which I always talk end of uh, proximal tibia. That was the X-ray. Efficacy of CT scan is this. Otherwise, we would have missed this fracture. Same uh, fracture as Peter, you have seen. So there was a big chunk of posterior medial fragment and a vertically compressed uh, lateral tibial plateau. That was a fracture. Uh, of course, the traditional way, conventional way of posterior medial plating. And I did a, a sub meniscal approach, lateral, lifted up the uh, laterally depressed tibial plateau and uh, used a rim plate uh, to fit that. So that's immediate post op. Uh, so to uh, wind it up, multiple plating in proximal tibia to add to biomechanical strength it depends on the fracture bicondylar with vulnerability to sink or collapse when it city will demonstrate you how to place based on which column is involved you throw in the plate independently to hold those uh, columns together with this we end uh, today's uh, web based uh, case discussions uh, let's move on to questions i will uh, stop my uh, screen sharing uh, Ashok, and uh, ask yes, questions. Sir. Yes, sir. Uh, which you have uh, thrown at me. So, so starting from uh, Ashok, you want to take this up? Uh, yeah, we can take it up, sir. Yeah. yeah so please go ahead, Ashok. So the question to first question is: What should be the length of the plate for comminuted distal femur fractures? It's for all panel. So, Kheru, you want to take this? Longest plate till the lesser trochanter. So that you can plan and span the screws at whichever you want. Whether you want to give a little bridge plating or whether you want to give a little bit of uh, stability more so you can add on. Whatever it is, you can plan. If you want to put uh, your medial plate, suppose you want after six weeks, if you want to put a six a medial plate, then there, there should be a difference of level of plate. So better to use a lateral plate longer so that you can adjust the medial plate if at all you require. That's a, if at all somebody is doing it later stage, they can add. But biomechanically, longer is the better. The standard teaching Sushut, is three times the fracture length if it's a, if it's a multi-fragmentary fracture, eight yeah. times the fracture length if it's a transverse fracture. I think that's a fairly good rule of thumb. Absolutely. Peter, any suggestions on this? Peter? No, I, I would agree with the three and eight principle. Okay. Next question, Ashok. Yeah, in case of comminuted distal femur fractures, uh, when will you consider primary fibula grafting? Are there any indications? Sunil? Uh, if it is the medial void is big, but sometimes you can consider the primary, but usually it is not recommended to do anything uh, unless there is a big, huge defect on the bone. If it's a five centimeter complete loss of bone loss, then you can have a central uh, fibular uh, plate and then you can uh, build on on that. Yes, Harpal. Uh, it is not necessary. Harpal. So uh, when you have such a big bone defect, it's usually a grade three injury. So I would not like to do a bone graft primarily in any open fractures especially grade three fractures, where there are chances of contamination and chances of infection. Uh, fibula will come, fibula or strut graft or a tricortical graft will come in when you have, you're sure that there's no infection. That's usually at six weeks or three months. John? Hello. Yeah, so I think very rarely you do get these very osteoporotic, very distal fractures in the elderly. 
And I think there are two occasions where I can remember in all these years where I've used a primary fibular grafting in these cases. So it's very rarely, uh, you sometimes have these uh, uh, elderly ladies which bone is just uh, almost not there and the fractures are very distal. So it's very hard to get adequate fixation. So there what I do is I put an intramedullary strut extending onto the distal end of the femur and try to put a few screws through the fibula across to the medial side. And I think together it forms just like we sometimes do for the proximal humerus, but much less common. And uh, uh, so in all these years, I've used it twice in a primary uh, early situation. In some of the eight situations, I've used it. Yeah. John, I want to correct here because sometimes if you put a, a, a through the screw through the fibula, the fibula may get fractured. So what your main aim of stability may lose. That was a risk. So you, it's not, it's actually not that difficult. We've done it a lot of times. So I don't think, I think you have to be careful how you drill through the fibula. Uh, so and, the fibula thickness. And yes, the you take a nice chunk of fibula. You don't take uh, splits. You take the entire full okay. diameter of the fibula. You can what usually get 0.5 screw without any problems. JP, you will do anything differently than this? But I said it's rare, not... JP. I would reserve bone grafting for somewhere down between the six and six week month period once the infection is controlled and you're sure you have a better soft tissue envelope. So what I was talking about was not an open fracture. These are closed fractures in the elderly with a very poor quality bone. I think open fractures definitely you tend to do the grafting later. Ashok, next question, please. Yeah, next question is from Dr. G.S. Kulkarni. Is commented that in distal femur comminuted fractures, lateral plating acts on principles of tension band. So integrity of opposite cortex is necessary. If there is a void on medial side, medial plate, plate is essential. What is the opinion of panel on this? Correct. So Jane, first. Uh, I, I think that certainly in our series, if we just use a lateral plate, a single plate with 40% fail by themselves. So with the community side, as discussed, I do think you need a medial support as well. So how much void is a void, Jen, according to you? Uh, so uh, I think we talked about earlier on, and sometimes you're going to have to do your lateral side and see how it is. And that's the big question, is it? You want your right stability. Sometimes it just looks too wobbly. And therefore, you need to you need to supplement on the medial side. So, Peter, I want to pin you down on that. You have <laughs> lateral plate. How would you assess on table whether that's a sufficient construct and not weak enough so as to ask me to put a medial additional plate? Peter, how would you decide on table? Well, first of all, you've got the CT to appreciate the degree of comminution and the uh, extent of... Uh, the gap that exists over the medial column, if it's more than one centimeter, in my opinion, um, that's a bigger gap. And then definitely you've got a deficient medial uh, column uh, case. Mm -hmm. Now you can extend, you can uh, put the knee into um, uh, valgus, uh, and you can uh, appreciate when you do that, whether indeed there is more movement on the medial side under, um, you know, uh, direct visualization. But I think the city should uh, give you the uh, uh, adequate information that you need to make your um, decision prior to, um, you know, start reconstructing the fracture. Okay, JP, you wanted to say something, JP? Okay, Sunil? Sunil, unmute. We now tend to put more on the media, uh, media bike under the plating because I we have seen uh, with the one only single plate, uh, the failure rate is getting more and more. So we have started putting okay. the medial plate. That's why he has John? asked the same question. Yeah, John? Unmute, please, John. John, unmute. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, so for me, comminution is not an indication for a medial plate. I think we have to be very clear on this because if you have metaphysical comminution, you bridge that area, that fracture is going to heal if you've got your biomechanics right. 
The problem is sometimes in these large postromedial fragments, which you cannot adequately fix from the lateral side. And I think we really need to look at this very closely because these are the ones, and especially periprosthetic fractures, that's the indication for me for putting a double plate. Uh, some very elderly uh, ladies with comminuted fractures. So there also I would try to avoid by impacting it a little bit. So if it's half a centimeter or a centimeter, I would rely on impaction rather than going on the medial side. So I'm, I'm very wary of putting a medial plate in all comminuted fractures. I really don't think that is a reasonable option. Okay, next question, Ashok. Yeah, yeah the question from Dr. Mukhi is asking about does the panel has any experience with use of Hans cage and bone grafting to fill the medial void? No, I think uh, very few Indian surgeons <laughs> have used it. That's uh, special to Dr. Mukhi. So next question, Ashok. No, no, I've, I've used it. Okay. So okay. we've used these cages for defects later on for bone grafting, okay? So when you have a, at a second stage in a masculine uh, technique for a distal femur where you have a big gap, I think the cages help you by reducing the amount of bone graft, et cetera, that you might need. Sure. Okay, Ashok, so that's, question, yeah. What are the tips to correct flexion as well as varus in distal femur condyle in cases of distal femur fractures? How do you correct them? Harpal? Do you want to take this? So as far as virus is concerned, my main tip is I use the cautery lead and I focus on the hip center and on the ankle center. So if it falls between the two uh, tibial spines, I'm happy. I like it to be towards slightly on the lateral side rather than my, it's never on the medial side. Plus, I can see that if my plate seats well and I have a good lateral cortex alignment, I'm not pulling the lateral uh, proximal fragment out. My medial continuity and shape of the femur is good. I would accept that. As far as flexion is concerned, it's always on table that you have to be sure. Take a dead lateral view where both your condyles are superimposed on each other and see that the anterior cortex is well aligned. You have to be sure that the interior part is well aligned and right in line. Otherwise, you're likely to err. Don't focus only on the posterior cortex. I'm not saying posterior is not important. Posterior is important. But also focus on the interior cortex to see that the alignment of the interior cortex is okay. okay. If your distal surface and the shaft are not ma uh, making a right angle or within three degrees, five degrees, you are erring and you will end up in trouble post-operatively. Okay, so uh, I just like to add Shishrut here. Yep. Distal femur is one of the bones which does not tolerate any kind of malunion, be it rotation, varus, valgus, or flexion extension. And this will show up postoperatively or in the follow up in your knee movement result. If you are not getting your knee movements, that means there's a malunion at the fracture side. Okay, so uh, same thing, you have to see the intercondylar notch view on image. There is a three types of notches, so you can have a smaller notch, elevated notch, and a normal notch. You can take comparative to the other, other knee joints, so that you once you achieve that, that means your distal fragment is not flexed. So that was one, one more tip you can add. Ashok, we have another 15 minutes to go, because in international society has to go back. So if you can sure. take some proximal tibia questions, please. Uh... There was an interesting question on the role of peripartite in, in these cases, primarily <laughs> as well as in delayed unions. Swamitra, you want to take this? Unmute, please. I don't think there is any 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 literature on uh, using peripartite acutely on these fractures, off even in case of non -unions. Tell us about off-label use. Do you use it? You don't use it? No, I, I do not use it acutely, but yes, I definitely use it for non-unions. Okay, Sunil, off-label use, yes, no? No. Uh, Harpal, off-label use, yes, no? No, George, absolutely no. Off-label use, yes, no? No. Uh, John, off-label no. use? So no. I use it for patients with very osteoporotic bones with fractures. So it's part of the treatment of osteoporosis. I don't expect that to heal my fracture as some people are using it, but certainly in patients who would 
need treatment for the osteoporosis and they have a very community Peter, practice. what's happening in England? Do you use this off-label, non-union, teriparatoid, yes or no? Yes, I use it only in pelvic uh, elderly cases where they got bilateral and secular non-unions. I immobilize them in a wheelchair. This sort of agility, um, you know, for, and then they go for three months on uh, teriparatoid treatment. What's happening? You're part of England, Jane? Uh, no, not for non-unions, only as second line therapy if someone's been on a bisphosphonate uh, okay. and they can't carry on with bisphosphonates maybe because of osteonecrosis. What's happening in Kuala Lumpur? Uh, no, not not for, for non-union cases, no. no. Uh, JP, Philippines? Yes, only, only for osteoporosis, not for non-unions. Okay, so you got to answer, Ashok. Next question, please. Uh, in case of loose fragment, how do you decide which ones to remove? I mean, loose bony fragments, which ones to remove and which ones to keep during the fragment? So they, in open fractures. Open fractures, okay. So they, open fractures. Uh, if it is huge and too big, then I retain it. I don't remove it, even though there is no any uh, any sub blood supply or attachment. But small fragment, you can remove it. Because the, uh, the latter, you can stage, you can remove it. But make sure it is not infected. Uh, right for my uh, day one if it has come to you then you can deprive it properly and you can retain it because we have also seen that outside although we have sometimes we have put we have published the paper also so why not retain it if it's a big particle uh, chunk of about four centimeters five centimeters just keep it don't give any attachment it will, it will form on the bone on the letter stage once you stabilize it okay if next. it not becomes dead you can remove it later so next question please uh, what is the role of antibiotic cement beads or antibiotic nail in open fractures, tibia? India. In <laughs> tibia, tibia, sorry. John. Antibiotic beads, uh, we certainly use. So let's put it this way. So if I have an open fracture, uh, day one, you do your debridement. Uh, if there's, especially if there's bone loss and a cavity, if I think I have to go back and debride it again, I would use antibiotic beads at that stage. Uh, when I think I've done my final debridement, I go to a cement block. Okay, so that's it. For the nails, antibiotic nails for primary fixation, we don't really have them, but we do use them for infected non-unions. Uh, Peter, what's the literature support uh, for antibiotic uh, beads or nails for uh, situations and what's the world literature suggesting where are we standing today if you are talking about antibiotic coated nail like the depusin this one uh, there is partial evidence from uh, a case series 100 cases mostly from germany where they've used it in different circumstances including uh, open fractures uh, with uh, of course, uh, the power of the study is not great, but it appears that there is a trend to support the use of them to minimize the risk of um, infection. And we are using it in, in my institution whenever we put an open fraction we want to nail. Uh, we do use the antibiotic coated nail in our practice. We've done about 60 cases up to now, and at some stage we're going to present the results. Uh, in terms of cement spacers, it's routine practice. Uh, we've published our series in acute fractures where we find the cost of masculet. It's a very good concept because it allows you to deal with uh, the void. You've got a local release of antibiotics and then you've got also the induction of um, the induced membrane where you can go back to graft and address the issue of bone loss without the needs of uh, utilizing distraction of cellogenesis. Okay. Ashok, last two questions. So pick and choose yeah. what you want to ask, Ashok. Yeah. So one question is about floating knee injuries, primary treatment. A recommendation is about external fixation. Dr. Huda is asking, can we use an inlaser with a knee hinge to allow early mobilization? Samitra. Well, I do not do laser, so I really cannot answer this question. But yes, uh, 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 Harpal wants to say something. <laughs> yeah. 
So initially, it's a spanning fixator. Harpal, so really? it has to be a spanning fixator. So later on, if you feel that the soft tissues are not good enough, you can do us uh, with a hinge or without a hinge, a fixator up the knee and down the knee. Uh, that's a uh, I'm not saying is a very common practice with me, but I do about one to two cases every year where the soft tissues are so bad that I have to do a, a laser of up and a laser of down. I put them in connection, start mobilization on bed, and then reconnect it back. I teach the patient and his attendants how to do that. But that's a very rare situation. It's a rare where it's, you know, there's no, nothing else will reconstruct your knee. Okay. Ashok, next question, please. Last year, general question, the antibiotic protocol after debridement in open fractures. What do the panel follow? Uh, Jen, let's start from you, Jen. Uh, yes, yeah, so as I said, so they get broad spectrum antibiotics in the emergency department, which is usually coamoxiclav or Ventin. When they come to their initial debridement, they have a shot of gentamicin as well. They stay on coamoxiclav until their definitive wound closure whatever that may be, primary, graft, free tissue transfer. And at that stage, they also have tycoplanin. The thinking behind that is then they may have picked up a MRSA while they've been in the hospital. And as soon as the wound is definitively closed, all antibiotics are stopped. John? Okay, so the problem with us is we very rarely get patients within the first six to 24 hours so to talk about pure prophylaxis becomes redundant. So we are actually treating infections when we are dealing with a lot of the open fractures that come to us. But uh, I think once you get the wound to heal, the idea would be to try and stop your antibiotics as soon as possible. But a lot of us come to us already infected and then we go to the infection management protocol, which means extending it to about six weeks. Stop. Yeah. Okay. So with this, uh, I'm going to call it a day. Uh, I really appreciate all the international and national faculty to join. And in real terms, bring the uh, world together in these difficult times of uh, Corona. And we all are fighting at our levels, orthopedics, non-orthopedics, social, uh, at home, every, everywhere. So I really appreciate Professor Peter Generis, my friend from Leeds. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Jane, Jane Ward from Coventry. Thank you, Jane, for coming. Uh, thanks for joining from Philippines. Carol, thank you very much. I appreciate that from Kuala Lumpur all the way. Thanks, so. Of course, uh, my Indian faculty starting from George Thomas. Great idea. We made it work. We made it happen, George. Thank you. Uh, thank you, George. Thank you, John. Shamitra, thank you very much. Sunil, thank you. Uh, and Harpal, thank you very much. I can't see Jai Shankar here, but uh, in absentia, please receive uh, thanks to him. Uh, this could not have happened if my dear friends, Dr. Ashok Sham, who is here, and Dr. Niraj Bijlani, who is sitting right here, uh, would not have put this all together for all of us. So thank you very much for this uh, global phenomena web-based clinical discussion. I really appreciate you all, friends, uh, to uh, give and contribute to all these uh, complex cases around me. Stay safe at home. My love to you and your family. Take care and goodbye. Bye. Great to see all of you. Yeah. Bye. Thanks, everyone. See you. Bye. Bye.